Alrighty, and we're here. Hello, Edward. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Great to be here. So, um, Ed, as I know him, um, we met uh, through our jiu-jitsu place. Yep, under the uh, illustrious tutelage of uh, David Tong and Stephen Absolutely, Tong. Absolutely, yes, the Tongs. <laughs> and, um, you know, we're, we're oddly enough sitting in, in, in quite a flash kind of a facility. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, I think so. I, anyway. I always feel that it feels a little bit like... Uh, a ski lodge, but um, yeah, a hipster ski lodge. A hipster yeah. ski lodge for um, for all your medical needs. Absolutely, <laughs> I do. It certainly, it is a nice environment. And um, if I was a client, I would prefer to be here. I'm just plugging myself a little yep. bit. Yep. But yes, it is. Uh, it's nice. And um, unfortunately, the weather outside doesn't look too great right now. But uh, uh, earlier today, you know, the sunlight was streaming in. Yep. Blue skies. Yep. Uh, you're right. It is a pretty good place to be, and yeah. um, I'm grateful. So, so for context, we're we're sitting in uh, Green Square, basically. Yes, Green Square uh, Health. Yep. Uh, it's a medical center that um that I work with and I'm affiliated with. Yep. Um, I'm not being paid to say that, by the way, but um, <laughs> you know, to the doctors and the owners, if they want to pay me, uh, my bank account is as follows. No. <laughs> so uh, let let let's let's go. Let, oh, I guess you know to give people a bit of an idea um, uh, uh, of I guess who it is. Um, he's obviously, you're a qualified physio. Yes, that's yep. correct. And yes. you got a lot of other things that you sort of dabble in as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, when people ask me, Hey, what is it that you actually do for a living? Um, uh, you know, dealing with a lot of, I mean, I'm sure your listeners, you know, I, I, a either know me or B are going to be, um, you know, tech literate enough to see my, my face on Instagram, um, but I'm Asian, of yes. course, yep. uh, Korean, born Australian, and um, just growing up here, uh, most of my family friends uh, have no idea what a physiotherapist is, okay. so the running gag is, hey, Edward, what is it that you do for a living? I always tell them, oh, uh, I'm a masseuse. Okay. Okay. Um, and you know what? To be absolutely honest, uh, manual therapy is a big part of what I do mm -hmm. and um, exercise prescription as well. And that is a very, very boring and professional and clinical um, <laughs> rabbit hole that we can go down. And I'm sure that that's not what your um, listeners are here for. You know, <laughs> of course, unless they want to talk about that sort of we stuff, can we talk, can do that next time. We can talk time. rehab and injuries. I think that's, also, <laughs> yeah. that's always a, a good talking point for any of the uh, listeners who are into exercise and martial arts. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I'm more than happy to go into that. I mean, we may need a trilogy <laughs> uh, podcast to get all that done i'm a pretty talkative person unfortunately um just ask my girlfriend she probably falls asleep um you know very well you know just to the sound of my uh incessant speaking yep um but uh yes i am a physiotherapist by trade yep uh having said that i would not say that the majority of my time is spent doing physiotherapy yep um i have a consultancy um, an agency uh, specializing in the um, you know the provision of healthcare in aged care mm -hmm. centers in Australia. Yep, um, that's something that takes the uh, the bulk of my time. Yep, and of course uh, I have a couple of other little ventures that um, uh, I'm I'm not at liberty to divulge everything, but um, a lot of it is in the raw material space for uh, the manufacture of PPE. Yep. Uh, specifically so personal in, um, protective equipment yeah 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 yep. specifically in um canada and of course that's uh that's a, that's an event driven um situation mm -hmm. um but other than that i'm always uh looking for um an interesting project that i can yep. get involved opportunities in. absolutely and um i really believe that uh you know if you do things right profit is the uh, side effect yeah but i do things because i like doing them honestly yeah. you've got an, you've got a genuine interest in them yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, for example, one of the things that I do and one of the reasons to, uh, you know, uh, Sensei David's uh, chagrin is why I'm very rarely at class sometimes, <laughs> you know, pre-COVID. And that would be because I'm usually, you know, uh, flying um, to certain places in the world yep. because I really want to just experience uh, a restaurant or food that I, you know, have been researching or really want to get into. Mm. Or uh, I'll be... Um, vetting and interviewing uh, tailors, shirt makers, you know, other craftsmen and artisans. And um, I'm well aware that I sound uh, like a, an absolute um, posh sort of, um, <laughs> what's the Australian word? What do we wanker. say? Wanker. Yeah. <laughs> I'm well aware that I sound like one of those. Um, but uh, look, I, 
I, I just love certain things. I have no control over yep. it. And um, yeah, if I love something and I'm interested in it, I'm, I'm going to go, go all deep. the way. Yeah, that's right. I, I think that, that's, that's what she um, said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm always, a, I always say that I, I, I have that addictive personality, mm. you know, um, for me, um, you, you know, if, if I didn't have um, my addictions with martial arts and, and those mm. sorts of things, like I could very easily get addicted in computer games um, mobile phone games, like oh, all that, yeah. all that Tell sort of stuff. It. Like it's just, you know, um, I just have that personality where, you know, for me, I, I abstinence is the only method that I can mm. sort of cure it because it's it's like, you know, if if, you, if I start thinking, oh, I'll just dabble a little bit. Mm. Next thing you know, I've I've invested eight hours and gone. <laughs> I just feel so guilty and uh, you know, look at this addict in the mirror, you know. Oh no, absolutely. Um, I can. Uh, I'm right there with you on that boat, a hundred percent. Uh, for example, um, I am horrible at controlling myself when it comes to food. Mm. Um, I'd like to think that I'm in relatively good shape. Um, and, uh, I always tell people, oh, it's because I'm doing intermittent fasting. Yeah. Um, that, and people say, oh, how, how is it that you don't eat for, um, 18 hours in a row <laughs> or, um, in an extreme example, uh, David and I did this together. I, I just did not eat for like, um, five days in a row yep. uh, before my, believe it was my f- second asia open yep and people are like oh my god but like how the hell do you do that mm. how do you show up to training and uh it's really quite simple uh when uh, it's a lot easier for me to just not eat at all yeah than it is to uh, it's impulse control right yeah, yeah. Then, then, then it to is have to, a little bit yeah then, then, then and just then feel hungry just, the whole just time the tip. yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. exactly <laughs> exactly yeah uh, i think i can agree with that it's like you know um sorry just to clarify this is a um you know it's a free for all. It's a free for all. It's, it's not PG. Yeah, it doesn't have G. to be PG. You know. <sighs> okay, good. You can Limit is off. Yeah, Limit, Limit is, is off. off. Okay, all right. So yeah, like I think you know when it comes to to fasting, it's you know um, a lot of people you know would be like, oh, I can't skip breakfast, um, or you know they find it difficult to skip breakfast. But in essence, that essentially is what fasting is. Right? Yeah, pretty much. It's, it's just your mindset. You can I mean, either, link, you can yeah yeah, yeah exactly. you can either go oh I'm so hungry I didn't eat or I'm fasting so therefore you know I'm gonna just suck it up a little bit. And but yeah, before yeah. I do get to eat, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, to be uh, a bit of a wanker, I mean, let's let's think about it linguistically. Breakfast, yeah. breaking, breaking fast. fast. That's exactly. right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right. Well, let's let's uh, let's wind it back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll get into all the uh, the little uh, nooks and crannies of, I guess, the the details. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess so. Uh, you mentioned obviously you grew up in in Australia in Sydney. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, People always ask me, like, where the hell does your accent come from? Yeah. Um, but yes, no, you're right. Uh, I was born and raised in Sydney. Yep. Um, I was actually born in a, uh, in Canterbury, just next to Campsie okay. in the inner yep. west, uh, yep. or the west, rather. Yep. And um, when I was uh, two years old, uh, because my parents were both, even though I was born here, my parents were both on student visas. Okay. So I, even though I rotated into this country, I wasn't a citizen straight away. Okay. Yep. Indeed, I didn't even have a visa. And after two years, um, my parents uh, thought it would be best if we went back to um, Japan. Okay. I'm, eth- I'm ethnically Korean, to, yep. to, to be Yeah, to so, clear. yeah, that I was about to say. But but Japan, because that's kind of where, um, A, that's where my dad went to university. Yep. And B, it's also where both my parents um, really fell in love and uh, were living Prior okay. to moving to Australia, yep. Uh, so, so both your your mum and your dad are ethnically Korean. Yes, both Korean. Yep. as Korean as can be. I, I know I've got like the wavy hair and. Uh, well, you've got the 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 true. You know, you you're, the, you're probably the second or third Edward Kim that I know. Oh, so, well, so you've got you the go. true. You know, Korean uh, English name. Yeah, yeah. Nominally, I am as Korean as they get, and uh, you know, phenotypically or um, you know, appearance wise. Um, it's funny. Uh, Koreans always say I look Chinese. Yep. Or at least the Koreans in Korea. Yep. Uh, Chinese people say I look really Korean. Yep. And they almost say it in a like a fetishistic sort of way. Yep. And um, uh, I mean, I've had people ask if I'm like Uyghur or like it's it's just strange, honestly. Yep. I just. I'm a person. What's the, I'm Asian. It's the yeah, yeah. The Asians all look same. <laughs> yeah, we're all the same, but we're all different. But you know, at the same time, you know, we're all the same. So, um, yeah, I think I was called a wog once uh, in the Shire, like oh, when I was wow. like twelve or thirteen. And um, other than that aberration, um, the only sort of confusion that I would get is, "Hey, uh, why is your accent um, a little odd? Yep. You know, did you go to an international school? Were you born in America?" Yeah, uh, I, I might get that a little bit. 
Uh, I went through a period where people asked me if I was Singaporean or Malaysian. Yep. Um, it's because I was in a long term relationship with a with a with a Malaysian. And, okay. Um, it just it just happens. Yep. You know? Um, but no, uh, uh, we I lived in Japan for about a year and a half. Yep. And so, then okay. came back. So what would your first memory be? Would it, do you remember anything about being in Australia, or do you remember only being in being in Japan? Like I guess when you think about you know becoming uh, conscious of your environment. Yeah, sure. Where um, were you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would say I have a very, very, um, I have a very nebulous uh, recollection of my time when I was living in Strathfield. Okay, that was in Sydney prior to leaving. Yep. And the reason for that is because uh, I was living near the station, and we were living in an apartment. And um, uh, most of my memories involve, you know, like the surfaces that I would be on, or mm-hmm. things that I'll put in my mouth. I know yep. that sounds bad, but you know, I, I'll never forget this 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 um, bamboo sort of mat that we had that kept us cool in summer. And there was like an alphabet sort of um, poster on the wall that was yellow, and the the, the, the letters were in capital, and it was um, you know in blue, but. Uh, Aside from that, because that could really be from anywhere, the yeah. thing that makes me know for a fact that that was Strathfield prior to me going to Tokyo and living there for a year and a half was um, uh, there was actually an accident, uh, a car accident um, in front of the apartment. And uh, my, my, my mom told me, oh, Edward, like, don't look, uh, you know, these things happen. And um, I never really saw what happened. Mm. Um I may have, but I don't remember it. I'd be lying to you if I if I had a visual recollection of that. Mm. But I do remember, um, you know, uh, my mum telling me, "Don't do that," and I heard adults kind of screaming outside. Yeah. And what I later found out was that uh, somebody had parked their car in front of the apartment, and they were they were getting out of the car, and mm. the car hit them, hit them. You know exactly, yeah. and took the door off and took their life as yeah. well. Um, and I believe it was on the spot as well, hence yep. the screaming and the ambulances yep. coming. Um, that would kind of be uh, my first memory, um, not one that I really talk about because, you know, I mean, it's not particularly, you know. A tinder. nice, a pleasant. Yeah, it's not in the first date, you but, know, material. But, do you, but that is my first memory, yes. But do you think, I guess, like, are you, were you conscious of what happened at the time, or was it just? I don't. I don't think you could really be conscious of, you know, nah, what, nah, like conscious. what has actually happened. No, nah, I wasn't conscious know? at all. Um, at that point in time, I mean, it was just. I guess you know, your mum wanted to protect you from obviously yeah. seeing something that was a horrible sight to witness. Yeah. Um, but you know, um, like, I guess, do you think that that plays any impact in how you approach life? That particular memory, I. Look, I'm sure there are some Jungians and Freudians out there who would say, <laughs> oh, you know, definitely. Um, but uh, I'm telling you the truth right now. Yep. Um, I don't think it does. Yeah. The yeah. only thing I remember from that was my mum going, hey, look, don't look. Yep. And I remember just going, okay, I won't. Yep. And, and so just being curious, that's it. In your household, did your parents speak to you in Korean? Uh, this, is a, this, is, this is quite funny. And yep. um, I do recall that you interviewed a uh, rather remarkable lady who speaks both Chinese, yeah, Korean, Rachel. and English. Rachel. Yep. Yeah, Chinese, Korean. Rachel White, yeah. Rachel White, yeah. was it? Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is quite amusing. Um, when I was a child, uh, I believed I was being spoken to in Korean. Okay. And for the most part, yes, it was Korean. <laughs> I only found out that it wasn't entirely Korean when I went to Korean school coming back from Japan. Mm-hmm. As um, uh, so, a lot of Korean schools were more or less just glorified, you know, daycare centers, yeah. you know, being run out of um, churches. Mm-hmm. And I went to one, and I remember, um, <laughs> I remember using some words, that, and and the Koreans just looked at me, and they were just like, "What is this? What yeah. the hell are you, you talking about?" Got some weird about? slang. <laughs> Yeah, what what strange dialect are you speaking? You know, and um, the accent itself that I was using probably wasn't um, you know too different to like a standard Seoul, um, you know, the standard Korean, Korean accent, yep. accent dialect, um, mm. standard speech. Um, but a lot of the words that I was using were um, were either Japanese or they were uh, dialect forms that um, that my mum would slip in there, you know, because she was the one who was teaching me. Yep. So. Um, I mean, I don't know if this will mean much to uh, a lot of your listeners, but for example, um, uh, God, man, I mean, 
the word for um, chair in Korean is uja. Mm. And I just went around just saying uja, uja. And sometimes I would even just say isu, isu, which is the yeah, Japanese word. Isu is the same in Chinese. Isu is the Japanese, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. exactly. It is the yep. same Chinese characters, yep. essentially. Um, so it is the same word. Um, but uh, in the delivery and me saying it to other Koreans, you know, at Korean school, yep. who are Korean Australians. Yep. And um, this is something that I may touch on, you know, time and time again in the podcast. But uh, uh, Korean Australians are intensely clannish mm. and um any aberration any de- deviation from the norm like yeah. a korean kid who apparently just came back from living in japan yeah it's apparently his, makes you an outsider yeah it makes you an outsider and more importantly um i had a notebook and uh you know we would do like you know korean lessons and we would learn songs nabiya, nabiya, all that stuff and uh, the front of the notebook would be for language Mm. Kugo, which you know means Korean, and then the back of the book would be for suak or maths. Mm. And the thing for me was is that I would be practicing Chinese characters mm. at the back from of the my kanji, book. kanji exactly. Yeah. Um, which my father was um, of the very very strong opinion that every educated Korean must know at least you know a thousand five hundred if not two thousand you know which is kind of the the requirement for um like a literate Japanese person mm. and um, he thought look you should get started now so I was doing that and uh, I will never forget the look on my not only my classmates but my teacher's face when they would kind of be like oh this guy's got some weird um, weird Korean yeah. I remember the teacher had to reverse park into a spot yeah and I would always be the one helping my dad do that even at four years old and basically I said a very 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 typically Japanese thing which is ah baku 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 all right all right and the teacher <laughs> you know you know had one arm out was looking backwards and they were like what the hell is this kid saying yeah and the classmates were like oh this kid's already like using weird words for certain things and stuff like that i even called the the, the car kuruma which is you know a japanese word and imagine their surprise when it came time for maths mm. and i flipped the book open and everyone's getting ready to do you know um uh, i don't know like you know eight times tables or whatever yeah. And there is a, you know, a kid with a whole like 10, 20 pages dedicated already to like Chinese characters. Like yeah. they must have thought I was some um, pro-Japanese <laughs> spy or yeah. uh, anti-Korean, um, like anti-patriot type thing. That was very much the sentiment amongst the um, Korean uh, community then. And it was, it was really funny. And the fact that I wasn't religious just um, did not do me any favors, do any favors yeah. no 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 so i had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder and um going back to a question that you asked earlier you know do, do any of these experiences impact you and who you are today um i don't know about today i'm sure it does but certainly growing up i didn't have many korean friends and at first it started out not being a choice i was mm. just an outsider yeah but it later then became a, a conscious choice i wanted to not be a korean australian I just like didn't a typical, feel like, like when I say not not to say typical, but um, because you felt like an outsider, well, you were treated like an outsider mm-hmm. um, because of those other experiences that mm-hmm. put you off wanting to be involved in that culture, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the short answer is yes. Um, so many things happened. You know, I mean, that obviously was was one thing. Mm. Um, you know, people just spreading rumors like, man, that that kid is so weird. Like, what's he doing? And yep. my parents would be like, ah, look, you know, like just just don't worry about it. You so. Know. From, from your parents' perspective, right? Mm. So um, it would have been a pretty big thing for them to have studied in, in Japan, wouldn't it? Like that, that would, isn't that sort of against, I guess, because if you think back in the time frame of the war mm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. An um, occupation, yeah, it's, yeah. It is a sensitive topic. Um, I, 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 Koreans are intensely proud oh, yeah. people and... Um, Oh, I mean, this is this is uh, you know a whole can of worms. Controversial, yeah. yeah, 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 absolutely. And um, you know, it's very difficult to have a nuanced conversation about um, this topic. Um, I, I enjoy this because I think, um, especially in today's world, everybody focuses so much on everybody's differences that mm. they forget just how similar we all are. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, and this, you know, it's probably offensive when I say it because you know I always think about when I think about language. Mm. You know, just just before we had a, a, an example of. You know, um, you saying um, um, 
a chair in Korean, mm-hmm. which wasn't too distinctly different from chair no. in Japanese, yeah. which is not very di- the same Chinese characters or same kanji characters, mm-hmm. whichever way you want to call them, yeah. as in Chinese. Yeah. So um, I think from a, a, a genesis perspective, they all essentially came from the same place. Mm-hmm. Right? Just like in any essence how, you know, uh, in Australia our, 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 our um, accent is a little bit different to English versus the American version of English. Mm. Um, but the genesis is all the same. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe the uh, – uh, this is sort of like a, a pet interest of mine. I believe the Americ- the standard North American accent, mm. something up, you know, something that you would hear on, um, I don't know, like CNN or TV. Fox News. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. The, the standard North American accent. Uh, I believe um, uh, has – managed to hold on to a lot of the vestigial um, pronunciations of like Elizabethan England. Mm-hmm. And the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, uh, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of people would be like, Oh, okay. 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 For example, I, I have come across many British people mm. um, uh, and highly educated ones, um, you know, who speak in a received pronunciation um, yep. accent, which is like the BBC English. Yep. And uh, they would be of the opinion um, and they've said this to me, you know, word for word, verbatim. You know, why is it that Americans don't speak the Queen's English? Mm. Why don't they speak the Queen's English? I'm like, well, America hasn't had a monarch for like over two hundred years. Yeah. Okay. But also, uh, the irony is, is that if William Shakespeare were to, you know, pop up from the grave, yeah. Okay, and he were to speak, if he, if he were to read, um, you know, a newspaper article, yeah many of the words would probably sound closer to the American accent than it does to the, uh, you know, received pronunciation, educated, uh, you know, refined accents, prestige dialects of um, British English. Um, but, yeah, even, but, even, think- but even like um, like old English compared to, I guess, current English, mm-hmm. you know, like the vowels and instead of you and, yeah. and those sorts of things yeah, yeah. and the yeah know. oh well well old yeah. english uh, well middle english is 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 far closer to old english but uh, old old sorry middle english is closer to you know um you know modern english, modern english. and it's it's almost yeah. you know it's almost understandable and when we when we read shakespeare i mean i know that it's um you know not up everyone's alley and it, it certainly isn't mine just, yeah. you know despite you know me talking about it <laughs> um it is by and large modern english yep when you read like uh, like Chaucer, um, you know you are getting a, a glimpse into um, an earlier you know form of um, of English. Mm. But when you read something like Beowulf, mm. uh, and that's Old English, you're mm. looking at a language which probably has a lot more in common with say German or Dutch than yeah. than, than than modern or yeah. or even Middle English, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and um, just like you were saying with like, uh, uh, you know, everyone focuses on the differences with like the Japanese, the Koreans and, mm. the, uh, and the Chinese. Yes, um, a lot of the words have gone backwards and forwards. Mm. Um, it's pretty clear from our understanding that, uh, uh, look, Korean and Japanese are um, language isolates. Mm-hmm. Let's say that again. They are language isolates, mm-hmm. meaning that um, they don't have any sibling languages. Why would you say that? Okay. Um, they don't have any sibling languages in the sense that, uh, strictly speaking, from a linguistic point of view, um, there are no languages that share a direct ancestor. So, for example, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian mm. are um, sister languages. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, because their parent language was uh, Volga Latin, mm. you know, spoken throughout the uh, Roman Empire. Yep. One could say something like, uh, you know, modern Romanian um, is also a sister language, or you could even say it's a, you know, a sister language that's slightly removed because it's been influenced by um, Slavic languages in the area. Mm-hmm. Uh, something very interesting called the Sprachbund effect happens, which means that, um, you know, languages, unlike, you know, genetic entities like people, you yeah. know, just because I hang out with someone who's got like a, a sick body and a six pack doesn't mean I just You're gonna automatically get, one. get yeah. one, right? Yeah. But uh, with languages, no, they do, yeah. you know, and... Um, so like, I would have thought that they, I would, I would have said that they were all part of that sort of Sino-Chinese uh, style of language. Yeah, I think, um, I think Korean also has some influences from like Mongolian languages. Yeah, um, again, um, or vice versa. Like, it yeah, depends no. which way you want to view it. Like, I, I don't yeah. say that to be to no, say no, no, that, no, no, that, not that, at all. That, you know, no. Korean is made up of other languages. I'm saying like, you know, there are influences that are drawn from 
all of those all of those regions because the simple fact that people would have mixed. Yeah. You know, there was yeah. an intermingle. Like I think um, even in high school, one, one, there was a Korean guy in, in my high school where um, I think he was saying like, you know, where he's from, like they speak Chinese as good as they speak Korean mm, mm. because they're right on the border. Mm. Um, and so, you know. Wow, I, he must have been um, ethnically Korean but from um, but from China because uh, the only way that – would have worked as either he was living on the Chinese border, but he was North Korean. And yeah. There aren't too many of those. <laughs> or he was ethnically Korean, but living on, but living in China yeah. on the border of North Korea, like just near the Yalu River. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, just on that. Yeah. Look, uh, I would say if you want to talk about the actual genetics, the yeah. actual, um, how do I say this? The actual structure and foundations of the language that will give you a lot more clues as to um, where a language is from. Mm. You know, I mean, think about it. If you go to another country and you don't speak the language at all, mm. it's very easy to pick up. Hi, how are you? Mm. I love you. Yes, no. What's your number? Yeah, you know, it's, it's yeah quite, the, sing, the single the, the yeah. close style. Yeah, 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 yeah. The and, words words come first. Yep. You know, usually swear words and then greetings yep. and then maybe simple sentences. Yeah. But to put together a grammatically coherent um, thought in that target language is extremely, extremely difficult. Mm. And um, and so it is uh, with just languages. If you look at languages and the common words that they have, mm-hmm. I mean, you could be forgiven for thinking that English was a romance language like French. Yep. I mean, we have like 70%, according to some estimates, of our language, you know, comes from, um, you know, Amen. comes from Latin yep. through, through, through Norman French. Yep. Um, and uh, simply, quite simply, no, it's not. Um, even though sometimes our word orders and stuff may be similar and stuff like mm. that. And a lot of the words, you know, if you read a French article, you might see words like, um, you know, constitution and stuff like that. Or, yep. you know, and you might be, oh, yeah, 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 that, that's an English word. <laughs> you know, it's a related language or... You might see the word, um, you know, par for like to speak, and you might think, oh, well, there is that English word parlance, yep. uh, which means like way of speaking. Ah, oh, it's related, but um, they are essentially, you know, uh, down in the roots, quite different. Mm. And um, a very similar thing happens when you look at the very closely related, and I say related, not in a genetic way, but in a generic way. Mm. Chinese, you know, all forms of Chinese, you know, Korean, you know, Japanese. And Vietnamese as well, you know, mm. by being virtue of that Sinosphere, of yep. course, are related culturally. Mm. Um, but genetically and linguistically speaking, it's very clear that Japanese and Korean probably uh, descended from some, you know, un, un, as of yet undiscovered, like Tunguizic, Altaic uh, language, mm. which had very, very, uh, which probably had like vowel harmony, um, probably had things like, um, well, we know for a fact that. Uh, you know, verbs come at the end mm-hmm. and uh, uh, there were intense conjugations, like intense and, um, you know, different speech levels, um, honorifics and stuff like that, as well as, uh, you know, and um, the, the thing that makes it so difficult for linguists and uh, is that just Korean and Japanese are actually grammatically so similar. Mm. So, so similar. It's quite rare when translating any language to another language yep. to be able to do a word to word um translation. translation yep. Uh one of the few um you know exceptions of that would be um from you know like say Portuguese to Spanish, Spanish to Italian, something like that. Yep. You can get pretty close. Yep. And the other two that I know of is Korean and Japanese. Mm. Very 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 close. Yep. To the point where you would you would feel that they are so related that it's almost like you're not learning another language. Mm. You are just it's learning a, a code. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're, you're learning a code. Yeah. You know, it's like it's like uh, when you when you read those, you know, when you're a kid, you think, oh, I'm learning a new language. You know, I've just invented a language. Mm. And, you know, I might be like, hey, Johnny, instead of the word like box, let's use the word like road. And instead of like this, let's do that. And, mm. you know, and it sounds like an, it sounds like another language. Mm. But essentially, you know, the, the engine behind the language itself yeah. is the same. It's the not another language. The, yeah. yeah, it's yeah. just another skin. Yeah. Right? It's a mod. It's yeah. an expansion pack. Um, yeah. If you learn Japanese as a Korean speaker or vice versa, um, that is most definitely what you feel yeah. um, throughout 
um, learning that language. Mm. Like you never, you never shake that feeling yep. ever. Um, Chinese is distantly related in the sense that the vocabulary, like French and English, is mm. so shared. Yeah, uh, so shared. And of course, the more advanced vocabulary gets, uh, the more shared ground there is. Mm. In the same way, um, I, I see. I used to think about it in the mm. in the other sense that it, you know, if you think about things that. Um, like old, when I say old, like, you know, um, the examples I always like to throw out there is um, when we talk about rice congee, mm -hmm. right? We call it chuk. Chuk, yeah, in yeah. Korean chuk, yeah. Yeah, so like, like, so those sorts of staples from, I guess, you know, historical times, a lot of those words are, are quite similar. You mm -hmm. know, the word for doctor is quite similar between um, Japanese and Chinese. You know? uh, well, in Japanese it's isha and in Korean it's, um, oh my God. <laughs> usa, usa. Yeah, and in Chinese um, it's isen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So well, th those are um, you know those are you know words that have been coined you know consciously with Chinese um, characters. Yep. Um, and the pronunciations have been more or less kept retained, yeah. retained through the you know through the three language. Well, I mean, with Chinese, of course, it's it's just done its own That's thing. Yeah. You know, and um, if you look at like Hokkien and like Cantonese um, pronunciations or mm. Minan, um, it's probably closer to like Middle Chinese. Mm. They've kept a lot of more of those like those um, like those ending sounds, mm. like ak and on and you know stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Whereas in you know in Mandarin, there's there's very few, yeah, and that's why tone became you know more 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 prevalent. Yeah. Um, Whereas in Korean, um, it's kept all the the, the, the ending sounds. Yep. So like in Korean, like. Uh, uh, Chinese, um, you know, Chinese derived syllables might end in like ak or al or an or mm. at and stuff like that, um, which you know really just makes me sound like I'm having a seizure. But I don't <laughs> know. But in Japanese, unfortunately, with their uh, with their rather rigid um, uh, syllabary structure, they've they've lost it. So the yeah. only thing that they have are like ending in vowels or a rather rather limp, like mm, like a nasal sort of n mm. sort of sound. Or if they manage to capture, um, like for example, um, uh, let me think. I mean, the word for white in mm -hmm. Chinese is what? Bai. Bai, right? Bai so, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. And um, and in Korean, it's um mm -hmm. Well, that's the Chinese way of saying it. Yeah. The other way of saying it would be hyan which is pure Korean. Mm -hmm. Pek. And in Japanese, you would say like uh, haku. Mm -hmm. Right, and you know, they have that K sound in there, they've mm -hmm. kept it. Mm -hmm. Mandarin has lost it, but mm -hmm. right, Korean has kept it, Japanese has kept it, but because they can't say ha, they have to say haku, right? Mm -hmm. So they, you know, so they add they the add vowel that on sound. the yeah, okay. Yeah. And it's interesting, like, um, this all really just sounds like, oh, is Edward really showing off that he can speak three languages? And it's like, well, no, uh, I, I, I do not speak any Chinese. Uh, my Japanese, as uh, people who have traveled uh, with me to Japan would attest, you know, at times it can be quite good and other times it's <laughs> just just middling, inter intermediate. But, okay, so just speaking on that, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, so at the age of two, you went back to Japan for a year and a half? Yes. And... What do you remember about that experience? Do you remember? I remember. Anything? Okay, this is where it's going to be less intellectual and more uh, more colorful. I my first memory is uh, seeing the Tokyo Tower on mm -hmm. uh, on a walk mm -hmm. that I did with my mum and my dad. Uh, but my my first really vivid uh, memory is uh, I peed. Okay. I peed on the tatami mats. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what were you sleeping? Uh, or uh, no, I was awake. Oh, I was and standing just... up and I just went for it. I don't know okay. why, but I did it. Yep. And I got, I got caned. Yeah, yeah. I was given a thick ear. I was, I was hit. Yeah, and I'll never forget that. You know? yep. And you know, I'm sure a lot of people will be like, "Oh my god, the poor thing." You know, that's trauma. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> there's I a lot you, to answer I for. Bet you learned that you weren't to pee on the tatami. Never pee on tatami. Yeah, <laughs> never, ever, ever. And um, also the smell of the tatami, like just fresh tatami when they had to. Re yeah. relay it yeah never forget that it's 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 kind of like um it's kind of like hay and bamboo it's f kind of fresh but woody it's yep. um yeah it's it's but there's a distinct smell to it yes yeah yes absolutely and so then obviously when when you're in japan um were your parents then speaking to you in japanese no they would speak That's to me in what i thought was, was korean, korean which okay. was like korean, korean but with japanese some, words yeah. and some things would be you know japanese like when i picked up the phone until i was like in high school i'd say moshi moshi like it's yeah. like i didn't but oh my god, sorry, it's your sale. You know, yeah. I didn't 
think you about didn't it. Didn't really think about it that yeah. much. Yeah. So then, okay. So then you would have been uh, what three and a half? Yeah, three and a half or so. Yeah. Four, four when you came back to yeah, came Australia. back and um, yeah, I was uh, I, I did preschool straight away yep. and um, I know that we're in Waterloo now and Waterloo is quite gentrified now. But um, when I came back, uh, we actually had a small um, Korean. Uh, takeaway restaurant in Waterloo, and this is where I grew up. Okay, you know, just a few streets away. Wow, uh, on Young Street, and uh, in front of the government housing, and um, you know they're high rises, obviously. Yeah. And my parents, just being completely culturally oblivious, just thought, "Oh, there must be a rich clientele here because it's near the city and it's yep. a high rise." And yep. our house got broken into uh, three times in six months. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and I went to preschool. Um, that's where I went to preschool. So that's where I started my, you know, my formal education. So wait, did you speak any English when you went to preschool? Uh, well, I don't think so. No, I would have picked yeah. that up. I would have had to have picked that up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, like, I guess, you know, when you when you think about that, so that preschool transitioning into into kindergarten and, and primary school, um, you know, do you, did you become aware that you know you were speaking? You had you had to you had to pick up another language, or was it just something that just sort of progressed no i think um i think as a child uh you know your learning habits are all over the place and mm. um you're not an efficient learner but uh it doesn't matter you're an effective learner yeah you just you just absorb things like uh like a sponge yep. and um i never once felt like i had to learn english mm. or um or korean for that matter yeah um yeah uh, for all intents and purposes despite me learning english second yep it's not my mother tongue um, it is my first language. Yeah, so it's become your primary language. Absolutely, but I think that's a that's a, uh, a, a product of our environment, right? Like we're in Australia, we're exposed to English on a day to day basis. Yeah, so, absolutely. so like you know, with my with my um, with my kids, you know, my wife and I made a conscious effort to try and talk to them in Chinese. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I can very good. I approve. Well, I, like I, it. I can I like attest it. that my my English is you know markedly better than my Chinese. Mm-hmm. Um, However, I think, you know, um, those things like what we're talking about with, with grammar, grammar and sentence structure and those sorts of things, like I think it's going to make it a lot easier for them to understand there's two different languages mm. if, we, if, we, if we try and retain some of that. Yeah. So, so now yeah. I'm also trying to like, you know, um, help my daughter more with, with her English because, you know, she's, she's in preschool at the moment. So, mm. um, Wonderful. You know, but I, 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 like I, I think we tried to make it very conscious to her that, you know, um, that – there are people that speak Chinese and there are people that speak English and you just have to start to work out who you can speak what to. Mm, and learn um, when to code switch. Yeah, yeah and learn, learn, learn when to code switch, um, you know, um, and that's, that's how we've approached it. I don't know whether it's the right or wrong thing. I think, you know, when you, when you get given all the pamphlets and stuff about, you know, early childhood learning, a lot of them say is to try and speak to them in, in your stronger language, mm. um, which, you know, in my case, it isn't my stronger language, but, you know, I make a, con- I make a conscious effort. Um, just because, you know, I, I want my kids to at least be exposed to it, yeah. you know, and then when they're older, then um, it's up, they can make that choice, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, I, I'd rather they at least be, have, be fortunate enough to have the choice mm. versus, you know, um, being closed-minded about it. Yeah, no, no, absolutely, absolutely. And um, I always say this um, to everyone I meet, I, um, if, if the topic ever goes there, I think people who are uh, monolingual only speak one language. I mean, I'm well aware that it's not their fault. Yeah. Um, having said that, I think there is a very tangible difference between someone who can speak more than one language, or at the very least has attempted to learn another language, mm. than someone who only speaks one. Yeah. And well, I, I think it impacts the way that you that you view things. Like yes. it allows you a different perspective, right? So I think you know it'd be akin to like learning a musical instrument. Yes. Because that to me is like another language, mm. you know, uh, it's like learning martial arts because that to me is like another language. Mm. And, I, and, and so the thing I always like to talk about is that, you know, I think um, as we get older, um, you know, we've got a choice about whether we get more set in our ways or whether we, uh, you know, try and embrace that sort of un- that discomfort Yes. Well said. Um, and translate some of those things that, you know, now when we're learning something new, it can actually speed up your pathway to learning because now you're translating previous experiences into a new experience. Yes. Right. Um, yes. Versus, you know, if you, if you didn't get exposed to that. And I think that's part of the reason why kids learn so fast is because their, their, their attention span is, is, is short, but mm. they'll try and absorb whatever they can out of each individual thing. Like I can give my son a toy and it might amuse him for say 10 minutes mm. and then he'll move on to the next thing. Mm. But it's like, you know, when he goes back to that toy, he still knows everything that he, that he, 
could do with it before. Mm. But sometimes he then might work out something new about it, mm. right? Um, so I think, you know, there's that, there's that sort of, um, you know, that there's an ability that can be pulled out of that where if you, you know, can understand language or you understand a certain type of skill, um, you can pull something out of that and then apply it to learning something new. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, pulling it back to, to, to you and, and, and growing up. So in primary school, like mm-hmm. what, how would you describe yourself in primary school? Uh, as in just the type of kid that I was? Yeah. Um, wow, I haven't really thought about that. I only talked to this uh, about... I only talk about this to my therapist. <laughs> no, <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. <laughs> so, uh, look, as a as a child in um, in primary school, uh, I think a couple of things come to mind. Number one, um, I went to a very working class um, public school, mm-hmm. just near Parramatta, and oh, so you're living in Waterloo? Oh no, no. So I lived. I I, I went to preschool in Waterloo. Then we moved to Burwood for about a year. Okay. Yep. I think we uh, lived in Castle Hill for a really short stint then. And then when I did the majority of my primary school years, from say year one to year f- end of year four, I was at a school called Radomir East mm-hmm. and it was a very, very, very working class um, school where uh, no one really, re- really no one gave two fucks about um, education. Mm. And um, Did you? Uh, <laughs> honestly, no, I didn't, but yep. my parents did. And mm. therefore it rubbed off on me in the sense that I had to do well, mm. but I didn't necessarily try. I didn't necessarily even want that sort of attention, mm. but, um, I just remember getting the academic award, you know, every year and, um, also being the only recipient of like high dis- remember those, um, English competitions and stuff like that they used to do. Mm. Yeah. I, I'd be the only person who a did it because mm. no one else wanted to pay money like, to do like, it. Like almost like doing mass Olympiad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and not only was I one of the few people who would do it in the whole school, but I was also the only one who actually got a good mark. Mm. And, um, did your parents push you with like outside tuition and that sort oh, of stuff? Oh boy. Um, they only did when it came to crunch time. Okay. So, so like heading up to year six exams. Yes, yes, yep. yes. And, and it's, was the expectation that they wanted you to get into a selective school? Yes. Yep. Oh, yes. Um, I got into OC. So yep. that's how I went to East or, you know, public school. Yep. And that's kind of when I was like, oh, my God, I'm not the only, you know, bright kid around. <laughs> I was all of a sudden in a school of like just kids who would, uh, you know. You're in the bigger uh, pond now. Yeah, yeah. Kids yeah. who would just read the Britannica like for fun like myself. I mean, yeah, it was interesting. But, um, you would actually read the Britannica for fun? Yeah, yeah, I would. I would actually. Man, um, I, f- I feel like a, such a simpleton. I, I used to, you know, cook ants with a magnifying glass. Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> well, I did that too. I did that too. I would, uh, I would catch lizards, you know, blue tongue lizards, skinks, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, I do I that think, for fun. Yeah, yeah. I think, play I think war that... with sticks and yeah. Uh, I, okay, actually, this is a memory. Uh, this was when Anzac Bridge was being built. Mm-hmm. And before I left my school, right on May East, before going to OC at um, Eastwood, uh, two of my friends, one of whom was an Aboriginal who ended up going to jail, mm-hmm. I believe. Well, and another one... Uh, do you know Aussie. for what? No. Okay. No, I just heard on the grapevine. And another uh, for um, violent crime, I believe, assault. Mm-hmm. Uh, his name was um, Aaron. So the three of us uh, actually rode our bikes from... Like, yeah, right away east to Balmain to yeah. watch the bridge. Um, Anzac Bridge be built. Yep. And that was like the last thing that we did together as a group of friends. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was intensely active and I, I did not, um, I did not voluntarily want to be that nerd. Yep. And I don't think anyone saw me as that nerd. I think they just saw me as like, wow, that kid is actually, you know, bright and does well. Mm. But I was never teased. I was never made fun of, um, uh, which which is more than can be said for when you go to OC and you realize that everyone in that class has yeah, like a bright. huge, yeah. yeah, is everyone's bright, but also everyone has a huge target on the back of their, um, you know, on their, you know, there's a huge target on their backs. And you know, the, the, the rest of the kids and the rest of the grade are just like, oh my God, those guys are the nerds. Oh, yeah. wow. You know. Is that how you feel? Um, sometimes. Yeah, of course. Like, uh, I didn't live near Eastwood Public School, so my parents had to the drive. My 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 mom had to drop my my mom had to drop me and pick me up. Yeah. Um. And sometimes I'd just be you know waiting for the car and people would be like, oh my god, look at that. Nerd. You know, <laughs> it was a little bit like that, but um, <laughs> you know, for me, it never really um, 
to be honest, it never really affected me. Yeah. yeah. See, I, I um, when you're called the Japanese sympathizer by Koreans when you're four years old, you know, you get a thick skin. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's gonna yeah. That, that's gonna yeah make you very resilient. Mm. And I think that's a good that's a good uh, trait to have. You know, I was just thinking just then. Um, so I went to a, a school um, called Crestwood Public School, um, which is in Borkham Hills. Yeah, Crestwood High. Know them well. Yep. And then we uh, played against them in um in high school in sports. High school. Yep. And then um and um but before that. Um, so we, we were living in, in St. Clair, which is like Penrith way. Yes, so like yes. sort of between uh, St. Mary's and yes. I guess, um, and, and Penrith. And, um, my I was parents, actually in that area three weeks ago. I know it. Yes. There you go. So my parents used to have a, have a shop. Um, the first shop was in, was in Blacktown and then they moved to this place called St. Martin's place, I guess it's called. And, um, and, um, for some odd reason, my parents would send me to Crestwood because I think, you know, the, the plan was to obviously move there. They, they, they bought a block of land and they wanted to build a house in Borkham Hills. Mm-hmm. And so for the first, um, from kindergarten to year four, you know, my parents would have to send me on this long drive, like basically, you know, from Sinclair, drop me off at Crestwood, then they go to work, then they'd pick me up and take me back to the shop, mm-hmm. be at the shop till whenever they closed and then we'd go home after that. So... Um, when I when I sort of that's immigrant living, huh? Yeah, yeah. like you know they, they um, the drives are very long. You know, it's you're always in a car, um, and you just sort. I think you know nowadays, I think we we just take it for granted because um, you know when, for for a lot of people, you know, a commute that's say fifteen minutes might be might might seem long. You know. Yeah. Uh, welcome to my world. But, yeah. but you know, um, for anything more than fifteen minutes is um, going to Mordor. Yeah. It's just yeah. And then, but but um, you know like when you when you're having to like for my parents you know for them to have to do that every day because they weren't just driving me to school they were driving me to school then driving to the office mm. and the office from Blacktown to to um, Crestwood would have been at least half an hour drive yeah. Um, yeah and then have to do it again in the afternoon you yeah. know it would have been very tough on them too yeah absolutely um, yeah absolutely that, that that's a good point um, I was always grateful that. Um, that my parents, uh, I mean, obviously I didn't want to go to tutoring, for yep. example. And Nobody does. Yeah. But um, I remember the first time I did it, we, it was new college mm-hmm. and um, we had to take a test and I'd never done a multiple choice test prior. <laughs> like, like not, uh, n- not one where you had to sort of, you know, color it in properly. Yep. Um, and, uh, I remember I got a horrible, horrible score for the first section. Mm. And I remember feeling like, oh, man, I've let my parents down. Oh, shit. Because my parents were like, man, what the hell? You got like 5% for GA. Mm. And that that's all they heard because that's the call that they got. Yep. But, you know, after they sort of like yelled at me for about 20 seconds, you know, they, they listened to the rest of the phone call, which was, we think your son filled out the answer form incorrectly <laughs> because for maths and English, he got like a hundred percent. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of, kind of quieten it down. And I remember when we went back to do the test, it made me appreciate just how far we had to drive. Yeah. So I was living in ride at the time and we'd drive to Strathfield to do yep. this. Yeah. And this is when, you know, both my parents were working, you know, there was no time and um, yeah, I'll never forget that. And um, later uh, I didn't go to, I didn't, I went to tutoring in high school only for English and only because I got a scholarship. Mm. And uh, the lady who taught me was actually based in Croydon, mm-hmm. which again, very, very far from ride. Mm. It was like forty. F- it was like an hour one way yep. um, during traffic. And then after the class going back, may have been, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, but still that's an hour and a half of like a, a an adult's time, mm. you know, which, and now I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm closer to the age that my mom was. Yeah you know, dropping me off than I am to my own age, you know, yep. back then, right? Yeah. My mum would have been, I don't know, 40, or yep. 32 now. So that's eight years away. Yeah. And at that time I was like, what, 12? Mm. God, that's already 18 years ago. Yeah. Right. Um, and I know just how valuable that sort of time is, but I mean, God, I, I even as a kid, I was, I was grateful for it. Mm. And even though I didn't want to be the nerd, I made sure to do well in the scholarship tests for that. Um, that particular reason. tutoring yep. college so that at least even if my parents had to spend a lot of time sending me there at least they didn't have to spend money yeah um so i like to think of myself as maybe i was a good kid yep. in that regard but uh, i assure you i was not in in in, in other ways <laughs> well the the thing that i when i think back on on those years of my life when when i like my parents would 
force me to do all the tuition and things like that. And, you know, I remember, you know, because when I used to have so much time at the shop, you know, my mum would, would make me read, you know, newspaper articles mm. and then want me to obviously do additional learning type of thing um, as a result of it. And, you know, when you have all these extracurricular activities as a kid, you, you, you go, oh, I just want to have fun, mm. right? I just want to play, you know. Mm. And um, But the thing, I guess, that I, I took away from all that um, as I got older, and I, it only sort of clicked for me probably around, I think it was around year 11 for me when it sort of clicked. And what, I, what, what it made me sort of think to myself was that, you know, when I was a kid and every day after school, I'd have to do something, whether it was piano or... Mm tutoring of some sort my mum had me enrolled in anything yeah, like you sure. know i think i've told this story before but you know she even enrolled me into a, like a drama class or like a clown school wow. where literally like the whole summer I, I went to uws and was just learning how to juggle and ride a unicycle and all this random shit wow. i don't i don't i don't know if she realized you know like that was you were what uh, she enrolled me in. you were an assassin in the making um, yeah. but you know when i when i when i got to and i i i pretty much stop, stopped applying myself when I got to high school and mm. was more focused around, you know, having fun and, and that kind of thing. Getting until, girls, that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, until around, you know, year 11. Oh. And, and then um, what, I, what I remember, like there was a distinct sort of shift in my mindset where I started thinking, you know, um, I'm not an idiot. Like, you know, there's my, my grades aren't good because I'm not applying myself. Like I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm, I'm here for a reason. Mm. Um, and... I had this thing in my head that, that, that I started to think about that if there's one lesson that I learnt from having to do all of those extracurricular activities when I was young was that when I was young, I didn't have a choice, right? Everything that I did was because my parents said, go and do this, go and do that. Mm. And then as we get older, we assert our free will. Mm. And sometimes we assert our free will in the wrong way that we don't want to do something because it makes us uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. And we, so then... We make decisions that we regret, of course. It's not to say that we regret. We don't think about the repercussions, mm. right? That, you know, um, so so what I started thinking was that, you know, okay, there's, there's nothing like, I think the foundation's all okay. You know, like the, the building sound, it's just the application isn't. Mm. So so what I realised was that, you know, there's nothing actually standing in my way but myself. Mm. Um, so that if I could do all of these things previously, you know, when I was a kid, when I didn't have a choice, well, the only thing that I need to do is just not give myself a choice, mm. right? And I guess hence that sort of leads into my, you know, ad abstinence from addiction thing is because if I, if I give myself a choice, well, I'm, I'm weak. I'm, I'm going to be a pussy about it, right? Yeah, I'm going yeah, yeah, yeah. to choose the wrong thing. It's all right, man. You know, you know me. I am uh, not politically correct at all. So <laughs> let's just take the gloves off and let's fuck it. Let's timestamp here. Yeah? yeah. This is where the real conversation yeah. starts. Yeah. And, and so then, okay. you know, as a result of that, then it's just like, well, you just got to take away the excuses. You don't give yourself a choice. Yeah. Right. And so like that was a, I think that was like sort of like the turning point for, for me in terms of how I applied myself. Yeah. Um, and um, I guess, you know, that, that then, culminated in, in in me really like pushing myself throughout you know my uni life and all that to to kickstart my career yes you know um but you know we, we're here to talk more about you than me but uh, yeah, yeah, i just want to share okay. that story no no, no so then thank you when thank you went you. to high school where'd you go i went to james Roos. you went to james Roos. yes yep hence that's why we no, played cool. crestwood <laughs> oh yeah absolutely. well i was at Borco, cool. so yeah, yeah absolutely um so i guess you know for context right so james Roos would be the number one high school in new south wales um, for uh, what we call our high school certificate. Um, and Borkham Hills, when I was there anyway, it was number two. I, I think they still fluctuate. They're generally I in that I believe top. they're two or three right yeah. now. I think sometimes Sydney Girls or North Sydney Girls yep. kind of takes that mantle. But, um, you know, it's much muchness. You know. yeah. so it's all about number one, baby. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> well, I do have a saying that second yeah. is the first loser. But anyway. Oh, we boy. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> but um, it's, um, it's one it of those. It translates into our jujitsu as well. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's right. Never no. do. Anyway. Um, so from that perspective, it's like, you know, we are, we, we are talking, you know, schools that are in like the top, you know, I yeah, guess yeah. 1% of the yeah. state, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, where, you know, the average mark is, is so high that, you know, if you're not scoring in like a 98 or a 99, you're basically below yeah. average. Well, in my, in my year when we did the HSC, uh, the average UAI was 90, I think it was 98.3. Yep. Um, but forget that. The median mark was 99.4. Yep. And as someone who got 97.6, I unironically went around telling people, I am a retard. I am stupid. Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing, but it's okay because I didn't study for the HSC. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was true, you know. And um, 
I must have just been an absolutely intolerable, insufferable asshole for, you know, the four years that I was in university because, you know, there were people who worked their asses off. To get there. To get there. And here you are. here, Here I am, you know, just not... To them, a to fuck them, about anything yeah. and, 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 and to add insult to injury, just saying, yeah, by the way, I'm a retard because I only got 97.6. Yeah. But it's okay because I didn't study. Yeah. So, okay. You, you're uh, making how these you, excuses for yourself, right? Like it's, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm uh, not proud of that, but it wasn't entirely my fault. I yeah. think it's just... It's, your it's, world it's, is small when shame. you're a child. It's oh, shame. Well, you feel shame, There's right? shame as well, but I think your world is just small. It's just smaller when you're a child. And mm. yeah, all right, I was, you know, six foot two and, you know, 16, 17 years old when I got into uni. But, you know, God, like, all right, maybe my skeletal system was like an adult. <laughs> but God, yeah. like mentally, but I was mentally, very yeah. much a 10-year-old. Yeah. I mean, I'm still an 18-year-old. So, <laughs> so yeah. okay, so let's talk about high school, right? Yeah, sure. So um, what was your experience like in high school? Uh, f- it's again, I, I, I like to reflect a lot mm. and, um, I like to revise and sort of just take stock of what's going on. When I was going through high school, I had a very, very good time. I had a very cruisy time mm. and, um, uh, yeah, like academically in the beginning I did excellent. I was at James Roos, but I was still like in the top five or top 10 in the grade for everything yep. for about two, three years. Um, and then when that started to slip, that was when, you know, my body really started coming into its own. And, um, you know, I was representing, you know, the school and the zone and then the district and then the state in athletics. So it, it didn't really, um, you know. Were impact. you more focused on that? Oh, yeah, most definitely. Yep. Oh, yes, most definitely. Um, I did not really care too much about um, academics. About academics at that point. I mean... At, in year 10, I went through a brief scare where it's like, oh man, I got to do the school certificate. But then you do the trial papers and it's yeah. like- It wasn't that bad. Man, it's like, I don't understand like this. I love our country. I love living here. But I remember distinctly thinking, okay, this is a year 10 paper. Mm. And the maths question number one was like, what is 15 plus 34? And I remember just thinking, oh my God, like how is it that the kangaroos aren't running this country instead of the human <laughs> beings? How is 15 plus 34 a question in a high school, you know, test? Yeah, but they're catering to all, all levels, right? Of so course, this, this of is course. where we've got to be careful where we sound, we really do sound like wankers, We right? really <laughs> do sound like assholes. Yeah, yeah I, I am completely, um, you know, with you on that. But, you know, as a kid in James Roos, I remember just thinking, oh my God. And I just didn't take it seriously and I got band six in almost everything. Yep. And then in year 11 and year 12, I was distracted. Yep. I was just too hormonal. Uh, I mean, I was for the most part a good kid and I was very, very, um, uh, you know, dedicated to athletics and also doing Wing Chun in yep. the city. Yep. At Jim Fung's? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sifu Jim Fung. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually had the pleasure of meeting him. I, I do not speak ill of the dead and he did pass away a few a few years ago, I think mm. 10 years ago or so. Yeah. But I remember distinctly making a joke to my friend who was there. He's like, man, like that guy's sticky hands. Chi Sao is really good. But do you reckon his hands are sticky because he's just always eating dumplings? <laughs> yeah, he was in horrible shape. But, um, well, yeah, I mean, you you see, you know, Wing Chun in the movies. You get a one-inch punch done on you. And then all of a sudden say, oh, I'm a convert. I, I yep. got to do it. And, of yep. course, I'm a massive Bruce Lee fan. And yep. I always knew that I had to do Wing Chun. So I was I was dedicated on those fronts. But when it came to studying... Um, outside of ancient history, which I was, uh, you know, which I was passionate about, and um, you know, three in it and four in it English, uh, I, I was really, um, I wasn't applied at all, mm. and um, yeah, I, honestly, I'm just, I'm just lucky that I have, um, you know, the natural uh, ability to sort of do well enough. Wait, yeah. so hang on, you're a Korean guy that didn't do Taekwondo. I did Taekwondo. <laughs> okay. When I was, okay, so, okay, okay, again, okay, again, <laughs> again, okay, I think, okay, I think we need to, okay, so the four player is done. We need to timestamp it to here. Because okay. I'm sure your uh, listeners will be far more interested in this. And the people who are listening to me, all two of you, <laughs> okay, <laughs> might be more interested in this. So when I was a child, I wanted to do uh, martial arts so bad. Yep. I wanted to do sports so bad. Yep. And my dad, this is one of my first childhood memories. My dad was driving me around this area in Redfern. We were in a van. He stopped the car, opened the glove box, and showed me a porno magazine. 
that just it was a rental van and it just happened to be there and he wanted to show me. Wait, wait, wait. So, how, how I was you? I was maybe four or five. And your oh, dad showed you a porno. Porno mag, yes, yes. And he okay. goes, he goes, son. In Korean, he's like, the sun, this is a magazine, what do you think? And I'm like, oh, I do. I don't you don't know what you're looking at, I, I don't know. Yeah. Don't know. And he goes, son, this is what men, this is what men like. <laughs> long hair, long legs, big tits, big ass, you know, just something really crude like that. Yeah. You know? And I was like, oh, okay. And then he said, what do you think women like? I had no answer. Mm. And I said, Dad, I have no idea. And he said, they're like men who are tall. They're like men who are athletic. And I think he said something about like having long hair and looking good in shorts as well. But I could be making that up. He said, they've got, they got to be tall. They've got to be athletic. And they got to have money. Mm -hmm. He said, look, you gotta, you got to have you know, at least two of those three. And that would have been that would have been already you know funny enough. But then he he looked at me and then he said, "Son, you are my son, so you're never going to be tall, <laughs> you're never going to be athletic, so you may as well study hard and get good marks and then get a good job and maybe make some money." Yeah. And by the time I believe I was in year five or year six, I was already taller than him. Yeah. And um, I definitely weighed more than him as well. <laughs> so. I begged him, I want to do Kung Fu, I want to do karate, yep. right? I, I saw The Karate Kid, I saw all the Bruce Lee movies, I saw, you know, Dragon, The Bruce Lee Story, uh, I saw Van Damme, you know, mm. Bloodsport, everything. Kick, I, kick, I, kick I, yeah, exactly. Yep. I, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be them. And I begged my dad, I said, please let me do, you know, Kung Fu. And he's like, fine, if you get into a selective school, I'll let you do Kung Fu. Mm. Get into James Roos. Yep. Get into James Roos. And I go to him and I'm like, dad, I got into James Roos. Okay, cool. I saw this letter before you and um, I've already enrolled you. And I went, oh my God, yes, here we go. <laughs> and he shows me a pamphlet for Taekwondo. Yep. For Taekwondo. And I go, uh, there are no movies about Taekwondo. About taekwondo. <laughs> yeah. I mean, later I found out that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the actual, you know, uh, that even Bruce Lee himself did, you know, Taekwondo under, under, yeah, 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 and stuff like that. But the kicks. Yeah. yeah, but at the time I had no idea. And I was like, dad, like, I don't want to do this. And he's like, oh, son, you're, you're fucking Korean. You're going to do this. <laughs> You're going to do this. And I went, oh, man. Oh, no. Oh, God. Uh, and then I saw um, I saw uh, the photos in the pamphlet. And I was like, oh, man. Like, you know, oh, it just doesn't look like what I want to do. But there was some jumping kicks. And I was like, oh, maybe I can do that, right? Yep. And um, so I started in 1999. And then in 2000, of course, um, the Olympics happened. Mm. That's when I realized that Taekwondo was an Olympic sport. Yep. And I thought to myself, shit. Maybe if I do well in this, I could go to the Olympics. Mm. And of course, I was never that good, but I did train with um, uh, an Olympic alternate. Mm. And um, what was his name? Uh, Stephen Kim. Okay. And I always thought, oh man, I should be able to do this. Um, however, by the time I was maybe fourteen or fifteen, um, I was a good height mm. taekwondo. I was, you know, I was around six foot. However my weight was a problem. Mm. I was already, you know, 80 kilos. Yeah. So you're dealing with the big boys or bigger boys. Well, the problem is, is that um, the weight divisions in Taekwondo, well, well, as beautiful an art as it is in its current sport format, it's like fencing. Yeah. It's about points. It's about yep. getting hit. Sorry. It's about hitting without getting hit yep. and scoring a point. You don't even have to hit hard. Yep. And, you know, people make fun of it. It's, it's almost like the punching bag of like the martial arts these days, but it's not easy. No. You know? But having said that, if you're 85 kilos and six foot, I mean, that might seem like a decent height and a decent weight, you know, when you're riding a Tinder profile. Mm. However, when you're in Taekwondo, 85 kilos usually means you're seven foot tall mm. and your legs are like the length of like my entire body. Yeah. So whenever I would compete, I would just get smashed. Yeah. Because like they got longer reach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if yep. if I landed a hit, yep. um, I might win. Yep. Because they couldn't continue. Yep. Or um, if they happened to be longer than me, but were just so uncoordinated that they couldn't really take advantage of it, then mm. yeah, I might win. But nah, when you get to the quarters, the semis, the finals, mm. at like a state level, at a national level, nah, yeah, there's, just, there's just no way around it. They know what they're doing. Yep. They know all the tricks. Yeah. They know how to create space. Yeah. They know how to keep you at a distance. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was just impotent. Yep. Well, I wasn't that bad. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, I think the last time I did uh, Taekwondo was um, 
uh, first year uni for the uni games mm. and represented uh, UCID for that. And that was a great honor. I got the silver medal, which was good mm-hmm. you know, for all the um, you know all the universities in Australia. Uh, but um, it was uh, interesting um, because in the final, I actually came across a guy who was built similar to me. Mm-hmm. And um, he actually knew how to, you know, play to those strengths as well. Yeah. And on top of that, the psychological warfare was real. He was the school captain of the year above me in James Roos. Ah. So he came up to me, shook my hand, and he's like, hey, man, Edward. He was Korean too. And he's yeah. like, man, Edward, so good to see you again. It's been so long. You've really grown up well. And I'm there going, oh, man, <laughs> I can't do this to a guy who's so nice to me. And then, bah, 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 you know, and then yeah. I just got... I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, I took it to the end. Like we we went the full three rounds, and yep. he won purely on points. But um, yeah, that was uh, that was quite the experience. And I remember just thinking, all right, well, that was an excuse too. I just thought I was too too stocky for um, you know my weight. Yeah. But no, I wasn't. Like this guy was uh, like a full maybe ten centimeters shorter than me. Yeah. Um, but he could make it work. Yeah, he was just better than me. Yeah. Just simple as that. And um, you know, I dabbled in other martial arts. I did capoeira for like two years. I did wushu. I did. Um, the boxing at PCYC, I did Muay Thai, I did all sorts of things. I was always just obsessed. Always is always obsessed. I did judo when I was a when I was a child with my cousin who was actually a, a black belt on judo. He's yep. Quite quite good actually, um, in the Korean high school system, which um is quite a big deal in Korea. Judo is a national sport. Mm. And um yeah, I trained with him a little bit and uh, yeah, I was always exposed to it. But BJJ was something that I always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Um, ever since I saw the uh, the first uh, UFC uh, on VCD when I was in year nine or year ten, yep. And I was like, man, I want to do this. And I looked it up on uh, dogpile.com and yahoo.com, <laughs> and <laughs> there were no gyms other than like Bondi at the time. And I believe yep. the head instructor was like a blue belt. Yeah. And we're just thinking like, oh man, like I'll learn this later. Yep. And then when I was in uni, I would envy my my friends who um were starting to do en- like MMA. Yep. So this was kind of when like UFC became like a bit more mainstream and. My friends were starting to do MMA and they were doing like groundwork, and I'd be like, "Oh my god, you can do a you can do a wrist lock, you can do a yeah. you can what do a this? yeah you can what do that sorcery you can, yeah you can do this from you know underneath someone like what is this right yeah. and um, you know like you I would always fool around with wrestling moves and chokes and slams and stuff like that with WWF WWE sorry now but um, yeah I, I'd never actually had it done to me like in a combative sort of mm. setting and I remember going oh I got to learn this but I put that to the side and I only did that when um uh when I went through a personal crisis mm. when my last relationship ended and I just felt like I needed to get my mojo back yeah the one thing that I really wanted to do was BJJ and I did that okay and I remember rocking up to a class completely terrified and um I rolled with Alex yep. the resident purple belt at yep. the time the mat enforcer the smallest guy with the biggest Shh. with the biggest crunch I would say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's putting it mildly. And he went hard on me. And the funny thing was is that I was armed with one um I was armed with one Gracie University lesson that I mm. saw on YouTube, which was the uh, Mount Escape. Yep. And I will never forget it. I had committed that to memory. Yep. The trap and roll. It's also the reason why whenever I come up with like a come up against a complete noob white belt, I, that I will teach them that because yep. I do think it's it's very important. Yep. Alex was on top of me, and I, I you know, he was side control, kesekatame, everything. He was just having his way with me. I had no idea what was going on. And for context, like Alex would be like fifty, late fifty kilos. Yeah, I, I would have been a full like 35, 40 kilos heavier yeah. than him, I think, at the time. And um, and then he made the mistake of taking mount. <laughs> And he <laughs> thought I knew nothing. But no. You had one no, move. <laughs> no, Hannah Gracie and Hiron Gracie, they taught me well. You know, they grab, you grab one of the arms and then you grab the leg, you trap it and then you roll. You know, so yeah. I, had that in, I had that in the back of my mind. And, um, you know, Alex was going for a loop choke mm. and he, he gave me one of his hands and I was kind of like, Ugh! I was making these fake noises and I grabbed his wrist mm. and then I did the trap and roll and I hit it on him. Yeah. And I will never forget Ever since that day, I knew what it meant to make a senior belt feel pissed off. Yeah. Up until that point, you know, they're either taking it easy on you or they're just practicing. Yeah. 
But uh, at that point, I knew, oh, man, I have just pissed some guy off, you know. <laughs> and, you know, not that he was pissed off. That's just how I felt. Yeah. Because I, I thought the intensity was already, you know, at 100%. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. just, I'm getting like, you know, I'm getting that's, squished. That's Alex's dial. He's only got, he's got, he's got yeah. three settings. It's a zero, 100, and, and 200. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. He's got yeah. He's got comfort. He's got eco mode, comfort mode, and then sports plus 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 traction off <laughs> yeah. you know? and race. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, in a with a, yeah, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll never forget it. I just remember going, oh wow, like okay, this is real. And yeah. then he did a loop choke on me, and you know, before he was probably doing the gentle version. Yeah, you know, where like one arm's in and the other one sneaks in, and then you go for it. No, I you're, remember. You're always going out. <laughs> I went home with a with a with a, a rash on my eye because he scraped the fuck out of my face with his sleeve <laughs> and I was bleeding and he was really nice about it and I was very thankful too I was like oh man you know thank you so much for that I, I bore him no ill will yeah at the time I was going through something very personal and I think I wanted some degree of pain yeah I wanted to just feel yeah like not numb you again. did get something yeah out. yeah and I wanted to know shit this is a real martial art you know yeah. and he gave me that in spades yeah and then of course my second role was David yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it only got worse, you know. But David was more artful. Like, oh, you're doing well. And then it was Stephen. He's like, Yeah, you're doing well. Yeah. You know, encouraging you. Meanwhile, I'm just like, Oh my god, I'm dead. And then I think I rolled like two girls, and then they 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 smashed me as well. And they were like, you know, like 50 kilos as well. Yeah. Little Asian girls. And I'm just like, Oh, I can take these girls. I think nah. Yeah. Nah. So that and that was the start of the journey. <laughs> yeah. After that, I was hooked, and um, I think. Yeah, after that, I, um, I I went at least, you know, two, three times a week for about uh, two years. And I thought I was good. And I went to a comp. And then I got pumped like 25 nil. I was <laughs> stuck underneath someone's mount for like five minutes. And I just felt like burning my gi. Yep. And then the second comp was, um, was a grappling industries. And uh, this was when they did the overtime. Mm. And I remember... My five matches for the uh, Gi round robin, I lost every single one of them, but I wasn't submitted. But I lost every single one of them in overtime. Yep. So that was like eight minutes yep. of fighting. Yep. And then I got to know Gi, and then I started winning. Mm. And then at the end, when I got the bronze medal, I actually won the last match with a just the sloppiest straight ankle lock <laughs> with like a horrible um, Ashigarami, you know, and, um, but I got it. And at that point I was like, shit, these submissions work. Yep. That was my first submission, a straight ankle lock. Yep. Horrible. I couldn't pass the guy's guard and I went, fuck it. Like John Danaher said. Yep. Try a leg lock. Yeah. Uh, try a leg lock. And I did. And it was, it was bad. That was I've, seen, I've seen footage. It was bad, <laughs> but it worked. But yeah. It worked. And then after that, I did go on somewhat of a winning streak and I did get some confidence and, um, you know, it was good. And I'd like to think that I am a, uh, a, a at the very least, a passionate student of the game. Mm. And, um, yeah, I've never looked back. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, it's it's kind of a little difficult. Made it difficult. Yeah. I think it's, it's made, made it difficult. difficult for everyone. You know? It's made it difficult for everyone. It's, it's doubly difficult because, uh, you know, I work in healthcare. And yeah. I, it, it, I, I cannot be seen being irresponsible. Mm. Um, not that I think it is particularly irresponsible, but when there was like a, like a, like a cluster in the area, I, yeah. I wasn't. Yeah. You got, go. Exactly. Yeah. You got to, yeah. You have to put the fact that yeah. you, you're meeting with patients. Yes. And in know. the early stages of like the lockdown or like when we were still grappling with what the hell is this yeah. you know, situation? Um, yeah. No, I just, I, 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 I mean, A, the gym was closed, but even when it reopened, like I just wasn't able to, um, yeah, yeah, go out there. I was under strict instructions. Mm. So let's um mm. let's switch gears a bit because we just talked a lot about martial arts. Let's let's talk a little bit about um. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about um uni and mm -hmm. obviously then mm -hmm. your progression into you know moving into work and mm -hmm. and, and and I guess you know businesses and that and that mm -hmm. side of it. Mm -hmm. So um you would have studied obviously physiotherapy at yes at Sydney yeah, Bachelor of Applied Science Physiotherapy yes yep and um. What made you want to do that in the first place? Uh, quite simply, I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of high school, I was uh, competing at nationals um, at the time. And I just thought uh, uh, f for athletics. Yep. And at the time, I just thought, all right, well, I'm probably going to get a decent mark. And I like sports, so maybe I should do physiotherapy. 
or I'll do physiotherapy and get my way into medicine and I'll be with all my friends and it'll be As great. A doctor. You know? Yeah, and then I'll tell people that I'm a doctor and people will know how smart I am because yeah. that is a uh, you know, that is a complex that I'm dealing with, you know, <laughs> something like that, right? That's uh, what, well, that's what your dad told you that yeah, that's what women want. That's what women right? want, man. That's yeah. what women want. So, um that's why I did physiotherapy. Mm. Quite quite simply, that was it. You know, yep. And then when I got to physiotherapy, I met all these people who were like, I've always wanted to do physio or, or, or you know, like, oh, you know, when I, was a, uh, when I was a rugby player in high school for the Waratah Shield, I, I you know, I, I did my ACL and then this great physiotherapist like mm. saved my life, you know. And I'm there going like, I've never even been to a physiotherapist. Aren't they just masseuses? I've yep. got no idea. Yep. I have no idea whatsoever. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a great story there. I just did it yep. and I just stuck with it. I was very passive. Yep. Uh, on that front um, university I just kind of again like just wasn't applied I just went through it mm. um, I guess I was good enough of a talker to sort of do well in the applied sort of bits yep. and then I guess I was just naturally naturally bookish enough to sort of get through the um, you know the, uh, the the academic parts mm -hmm. and I just uh, I just made it through I wouldn't say flunked it through but I just I just made it through and please it get wasn't. degrees <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I just got my degree. And um, at the time I was working, um, putting myself through uni because uh, I would pay up front. Yep. I, I, I was Commonwealth supported, but I, 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 I wanted to pay up front. You wanted the discount? Yeah, I wanted the discount. Okay. Exactly. So, so what I were you doing for work? So I was, a suits, ugh, I was a suit salesman at Hugo Boss. Uh, okay. Yeah, which I did. How did you end up with that gig? Well, you know what? I, I, I've i always been into clothes. Mm. Never, you know, from a family that could afford, you know, like high end, great looks yeah. and yeah, and high end and stuff like that. But I always love clothes. This is going to be a very gay thing to say. No offense to gays. But um, <laughs> I was always interested into costumes and stuff like that, like in movies. I would, yep. It would always stick out to me. Um, But yeah, like one day I just heard from a, a friend of a friend that uh, he had a gig at Hugo Boss and that he could get discounts. And that was something that piqued my interest. I was like, oh, there's a way to get discounts there, huh? Sign and me up. <laughs> yeah, and I was like, can can you can he get me um, a referral? And he was like, no, he doesn't want to. I, I, later, I found out that he was a very like jealous and um, sort of uh, protective sort of guy. Yeah. But that would not stop me. I rocked up in person and I handed in a comically over the top um, resume cover letter. Yep. Resume was very basic. Okay. Resume was but the cover basic. letter. It was the, the cover best letter cover was letter you've written in your life. I poured my heart and soul <laughs> into this thing, man. They're gonna they're gonna make you the manager based on that cover. Yeah, letter. man. And I even I even um stape I, like I, I put the cover letter in like a little like plastic sleeve. You know, Did you it? laminate it? No, no, no. I didn't. But like in the holes, I actually tied one of the uh, Hugo Boss uh, labels. Oh wow! In the hole, I, I was. You so went all the way. Yeah. I went all the way. It was bespoke. It was a bespoke. cover It was letter. a bespoke cover letter. Absolutely. Yep. And I think I said something along the lines of like. I'm learning uh, the academic side of things like at, 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 uh, at university, but I really want to learn the ability to sell and the ability to, you know, uh, build rapport with people really quickly, real life skills that you will never learn in a classroom yeah. and stuff like that. And I'll never forget it. I remember dropping off the cover letter and then kind of like leaving and then like looking through the window and I just saw like the manager and the assistant manager like reading through it and laughing. And I remember going, hmm, I don't know how well this is going to go. Yeah. But something clicked, man. Something worked. And um, it's kind of a theme of my life, but uh, they gave me a break and they actually allowed me to do it. Yep. And uh, I did quite well. Mm. And it was a gig that I maintained for about uh, six, seven years. So, okay, L let's let's talk about this because I th I find this really interesting. Um, and you know, I'm I'm in a sales industry, so mm. I'm, I'm very passionate about sales because. I always think that there's... Um, By the way, if you would like to hire me, <laughs> I wouldn't mind working as a salesman once more. Anyway, continue, <laughs> continue. So, you know, I, I really like um, this relationship between selling and life. Like I think people, um, a, a lot of people would say, oh, selling, that's not for me. They view that as a skill that is, you know, uh, you need the personality for it. Mm. Um, I view it as it's a way to approach life that can impact you know, the quality of your relationships. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, like when I did the uh, a podcast with um, Mark uh, from Jiu-Jitsu, the anaesthetist. The um, doctor with the golden voice. Yeah. Well, we, we were talking, we were to like we were, I was talking about that, how, you know, um, what I've learned in sales, I think has helped me with my interpersonal relationships um, from the perspective of, 
you know, um, being able to, I guess, tabulate, you know, mm. what, 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 are we, what are we trying to, what are we trying to achieve? Mm. You know, what are both parties trying to achieve? Mm. And is there actually a, a, a common ground or a happy ground that we can, we can obviously compromise on mm. or, or come to a conclusion towards? Mm-hmm. Or are we not approaching this in the right manner or approaching it for the right reasons? Now, I can't say that I'm, I'm a professional at relationships. I've got, you know, many failed relationships. Mm. Um, and I, I, I would... It's okay. You only need one. That's right. You only need right? one. But they're, they're all learnings as well. Like I think, you know, what my takeaways from those were was that I wasn't, um, I wasn't ready in terms of like, you know, I wasn't happy with myself as a person. Mm-hmm. I wasn't who I wanted to be. And I think a lot of people sometimes think that, you know, uh, a relationship is meant to help you become more of who you want to be, where mm. you need to have that in yourself first before you can make anybody else happy. Mm. that's the way I view it anyway. Yeah, correct. Um, I, you know, whether that's the right or wrong thing, I can only tell you what's worked from my experience. And I think, correct. you know, um, so when I, when, I, when, when I talk about, you know, the philosophy, philosophy of selling, um, you know, it's almost like dating, you know, you've got that meet and greet, you know, where you, where you meet somebody, you say hello, mm-hmm. you know, you're trying to pique some interest or gauge interest, you know, yeah. whichever way it may go. You know, you might have the person on the yard that just says, no, I'm just looking, doesn't want to engage with you. No problem, right? Mm. But when you find that right person who does want to engage with you, then you go to the, that next level where, yeah. you know, you're into a conversation, yeah. you know, just like, you know, we're having a conversation here where we're, yeah. we're talking about, you know, what has each person experienced and, you know, what are some of those things that we're discovering about each other? Yeah. And then that, that then leads to, you know, I guess in a romantic context that that can then go into the next stage where, you know, we might be talking to multiple people, multiple prospective partners, mm-hmm you know, at one time for whatever reason. I guess it's probably more prevalent in today's age, you know, with Tinder and all these dating apps. Yes. Um, it's before my time, unfortunately. So, Unfortunately. Um, <laughs> oh, you missed out, man. <laughs> but missed out. From, from that perspective, um, you know, when, when you do, I guess if, you've, if you're happy enough with what you've mm. discovered in that needs discovery phase, um, you select a person and, yeah. and then you enter a relationship and that might be a test drive. Right, so you know we can liken that to a test drive. You can take it in the crude manner if you like, right? That could also be viewed as a test drive. It depends on what you're trying to ascertain from test the test drive. drive right? You got to check out the you got to check out the caboose. <laughs> you got to see how much trunk space there is. <laughs> What's under the hood? Yeah. Um, and then is it a straight six? <laughs> straight and, eight. And then from <laughs> from from that, um, you know, and after you've you've gone through that that test drive sort of um, layer, I guess, or process. Um, you're going to start to understand, is this the relationship that I want or am I looking for something else? Yes. Right. And I think far too often some people never get to the next stage where we actually then put the cards on the table and say, okay, well, this is where I'm at in life. Mm. You know, where are you at? And and what is it that you actually want to get out of this? My goodness, that is uh, the least romantic thing I've ever heard, Johnny. (laughs) It might be the least romantic thing. No, but it's practical. It's practical. Because what, you know, I think everybody goes... it's correct, actually. You've got to think about, okay, so... It's correct. If you think about, you know, when people enter relationships, everybody talks about the honeymoon phase, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's correct. Because it's it's passionate. It's it's exciting. It's new. It's engaging. You know, everything is like, you know, you're seeing the the world through fucked up glasses because you know you're basically your whole picture is painted like it's fucking rainbows and daffodils yeah well you're you're basically lurching from orgasm to orgasm yeah. so um yeah, you're, yeah. all your all your all your hormones are probably jacked up on oh, yeah. you know on oh, all yeah. the um what is it oxytocin or whatever it is all that yeah. sort of shit yeah. um and so but you know depending on what you want out of the relationship at some point you need to have um, a logical glue. I would. Uh, that's the way I would put it. Like a logical glue that binds you together. Correct. Because yeah. it's all great to have this passion and this excitement and this wonderful, you know, all these wonderful emotions. But then once the dust settles, yeah, right. Yeah. What are you? What are you left with? Are, are, you, are you looking at the other person going, "What the fuck have I done?" Yeah. Right. Or are you yeah. looking at them like, you know, um, I, I'm actually, you know, I'm actually making that conscious decision that I want to yeah. be in this relationship. Man, we've got to timestamp this for uh, the listeners as well. Uh, yet another, uh, yeah, uh, huge topic. Um, like yourself, I don't profess to be a, um, you know, like a, rela- a relationship guru mm. uh, in the least. Nonetheless, um, I agree with what you said wholeheartedly. Mm. I do think there ideally should be an element of that honeymoon. Like mm. it, it's great to be crazy about each other. Yeah. Like you need that. You need that. Um, like it, it's like exercise. There's the, like it, you can tell someone to exercise as much as they want. Yep. But if they don't enjoy 
the process of exercising, like good luck, yep. right? Good luck. Like no amount of money, no amount of whipping is going to get them there. Yep. Okay? And it's the same with relationships. Like, yeah, it's going to be hard work, man. Oh, it's going to be hard work. You know, as a man, like you're going to be, I don't know, you're going to get pissed on the floor in the bathroom, mm. you know? There's going to be, you know, the woman's hair clogging the, um, you the know, drains. The, the drains in a the shower. The shower and stuff like that. And, you know, um, yeah, and also like non-traditional, you know, you know, um, you know, relationships like, like, you know, you know um, there's always going to be problems mm. always because it's hard enough getting along with yourself, mm. getting along with another person. Like, Oh my God, it's difficult. Yeah. Having said that, if you're crazy about each other, mm. then it's good. Then at least it's bearable and you want you want to go through those struggles with someone. Because you're going to have to go through the struggles with someone anyway. Yeah, exactly. So you may as well go through it with someone that you think it's worthwhile. Yeah. And for the record, if you don't find someone that you're crazy about and you start making those sacrifices, I'm pretty sure you're just going to be looking at them and going, oh my God, what the hell am yeah. I doing with you don't, those you, you don't dumb, feel any slow shoulders? Like, right? what the fuck yeah. are out? And I'm sure like, you know, yeah, it goes both ways. Like, you know, like if a woman was not crazy about me and I do, you know, God knows, like so many stupid things, she'd probably be thinking, oh my God, I probably should have married the doctor. I'm like, oh man, like why? You <laughs> yeah. know, sort of thing. So you want to be with someone who's crazy about you, of yeah. course. Yeah. Maybe not all the time, but at least most of the time. Well, you need, I think you need, you need, um, I think, you know, as um, that sort of, you know, honeymoon passionate style uh, emotion you know, that ebbs and flows. Yes. Right. I think, you know, it just like your motivation in life for different things, yeah, ebb and flow. and flow. like whether yeah, it's yeah. martial arts, whether it's exercise, whether it's studying and all these things, mm. like you go through those peaks and troughs and likewise, you know, I, I think it's, it's only um, fair to say that that happens in, in relationships too. Yes. Right. Your passion can ebb and flow. Yeah, of course. Um, or get misdirected to yeah. other people, yeah. other things. That's right. So, so you Sad, need to have true. that. You need to have that. To me, I, I think it's just, that's why. That's what makes a relationship stronger is is knowing that you have this logical glue that binds you together. Yes, you know um, that you've that you've had a conversation. It doesn't mean that you have to agree on everything. I mm. don't say that because you need to agree on everything. But there there are, there are boundaries where people go. Well, it has to be this mm. because that is something that's so to the core of their being. Like for me, mm. that would be like um, martial arts, right? Like yeah. I'm always going to train. Um, yeah. It's a lifestyle for me. Like it's a lifestyle yeah. that I've chosen. Yeah. So if I had somebody that didn't understand that, yeah, then of course, it yeah, there work, are certain things that right? are fairly black yeah. and white. Yeah. And for some people, it could be religion. You know, my, yeah. my wife is is very religious, and mm. I don't I don't mind that. Like I mm. I, I admire that about about her because she yeah. I can see that her passion for religion would probably be on that same sort of vein. Sure. That it's a part of part of her being. Sure. So um, you know, if I'm unwilling to accept that, then it's almost deceitful of me to enter yeah, the relationship. Yeah, you should have just be with somebody else. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Um, okay, let's get back to Hugo Boss. I, I know okay. we just went on a, a yeah, huge yeah, yeah. tangent about that's relationships. Fine, that's fine. So talking about Hugo Boss, um, yes. and s like, did anyone tra give you any training about how to sell a suit? Or yes, yep, yes. Uh, look, in the beginning, um, I didn't have any training in sales whatsoever. Yep, I had a somewhat of a background in customer service because I, I worked at a, a couple of restaurants, you know, all owned by my dad. Um, but it's not the same thing. Yep, right. And I remember just voraciously just reading everything I can. I, I remember reading like askmen.com, like articles, how to sell, yep. uh, selling for dummies. And know. is there any advice that sticks, still sticks in your mind from that, from that experience of reading? Uh, mm, no, honestly, not really. I think the so first- So shit advice. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. I would, it was, all, it was sorry, it was very generic. Mm. I would say the first piece of selling advice that I actually sort of, um, took on board was identify a need and be the solution. Mm. I think I got that from some entrepreneurial magazine or something that I picked up like, mm. somewhere. But no, um, everything that I learned very much was on the job. Mm. I'll never forget my first sale of like a, a high-end t-shirt. I think it was like $250, which, you know, at the time just seemed like astronomical money. I guess it still is for a t-shirt, to be honest. Wasn't great either. wasn't a wasn't a great T shirt, <laughs> but I sold it. I remember just thinking, "Oh my god, I just did this thing." Yeah, it was just it was just like, "Oh my god," it was like stands I, out in your memory. Yeah, I was just like, "Oh, I talked a girl into sleeping with me." Oh my god, you know, like, yeah. how did I do that? You yeah, know? 
And but did you lie to get the sale? No, no, I didn't. No, no I didn't. I think I was mistaken about something, okay. but honestly mistaken. You know? <laughs> but no, I did not lie. Um, and then I just got, but I got better and better and better at it. And then I got formal training in how to sell suits. Yep. And that was when my love of suits really um, took off. Mm. That's when I started talking to the tailors in the back at King Street. I, um, I actually taught myself Italian so that I could read, um, you know, tailoring magazines from, you know, from Italy, from Italy, from the, uh, last century, like 1950s and 60s. Okay. So, okay, what was the fascination with 1950s and 1960s Italian suits? Uh, well, honestly, it back then there was a thriving um, tailoring industry. Mm. I mean, there still is in Italy. Um, it's mostly a cottage industry, but it's still thriving at least. Mm. Um, there aren't many countries in the world where there is a strong tailoring tradition other than perhaps today uh, England, France, uh, Italy, parts of Japan, parts of Spain and other parts of Europe. You know, when you say that, are you talking about in terms of bespoke tailoring? Bespoke tailoring, yeah. like hardcore yeah. bespoke tailoring. Yeah. I don't You're mean, not talking about, you know, going to Vietnam and getting the cheap no, suit. No, 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 absolutely not. No offense to Vietnam. No, 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 absolutely yeah. not. I mean, that has its place. Yeah. But, um, you know, no, that's not what I'm talking about. What I mean is like high-end bespoke tailoring that uses, you know, certain traditional high-end craftsmanship uh, techniques. Mm-hmm. Um, it was probably at its heyday in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Well, yeah. everything from 1920. Everything from like 1910, uh, when Schultz really started, you know, uh, changing the cut of like, uh, you know, like the British suit, he pretty much invented the drape cut, blah, blah, blah. There was some, um, you know, then there was like the Art Deco period in the, you know, in the 20s, you know, the Great Gatsby, like that mm. was a high point as well. Edwardian in, um, in, in, in England and um, a very, very, you know, Belle Epoque type thing for, uh, for America. And then I would say after like, you know, you know, uh, the Great World War too, you know, um, you know, people weren't really into it, but, you know, the 50s, 60s and 70s was really when, you know, magazines and international cooperation really started, you know, picking up. Mm. And um, I just, those were the only magazines I could get on eBay. Yeah. And none of them were in English. Some of them were in German. I never really enjoyed the sound of German, yep. I'm sorry to say, although I do think it is a beautiful and interesting language. However, Italian, yes. Mm. And I thought it would be easy to learn. God, was I wrong? I thought it was easy to learn. Oh, oh that's the same alphabet as English. Oh, yep. The words are the same. I'll do it. You know, how, how, how difficult could it be? You know, I already know how to say it's a Mario. Like I already speak Italian. Right? <laughs> oh God, I was so wrong. But, you know, I taught myself that. And um, I went to Malaysia. I saw um, bespoke tailors there. I got bespoke tailors, you know, bespoke um, items made in Hong Kong by a upper mid-range, you know, tailor in Hong Kong. Yep. Uh, I had bespoke made in Japan which was wonderful, but just wasn't, it just didn't suit my physique. I had bespoke made in Korea, which was wonderful, but the process was just, um, just wasn't ideal because we needed to go through an agent mm. um, who was extremely talented and great. But just um, at the time, I think my style was just far, it was just a little um, all over the place. I didn't know, you know, what, what you I wanted, wanted to look like or, yep. you know, what sort of clothes I found beautiful. So, I mean, it's it's the, the blame is not on the tailor or the agent. Yeah, the fitter. At it's that on point. it's on your. It was on me. Whatever, whatever no your vision, vision was. I yeah. had no vision. Um, however, I have found I believe uh, my tailor for life in uh, in Italy, and um, I'm a faithful guy. I'm loyal, and um, I don't really think I'll be going anywhere soon. Mm. And what is it? So when you s- try to formulate this vision, yeah, right. What is this vision like? How, how did you how did you come to it? Like, was it was it influenced by all these uh, magazines and these books that you've read, hmm. or um, or what 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 sort of how yeah, did you come to yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, I I, I, guess, I guess I always had a very um, diffuse sort of a general idea that uh, men look good when they're wearing grown up clothes, sort of thing. Mm. I never really liked, and again, I'm going to sound like a wanker, but I didn't really like how uh, my friends dressed. Mm. You know, baggy jeans. And and then later skinny jeans and stuff like that. Um, I always thought that, you know, suiting looked best. Mm. And um, just with my physique, I, because of track and feel, I just have a very large seat. Mm-hmm. And, In other um, words, a big ass. A big ass. You know, I, got a, I, got a, <laughs> I got a big caboose. So um, it was always difficult for me to sort of fit into clothes that I, that I f- yep. kind of liked or, and other people, you know, told me I was meant to like. Yep. So I always liked tailoring and the idea of it um, and sweatpants, which is, you know, athleisure, of course. Mm. Um, but my idea was probably informed on some level by, you know, TV shows like Mad Men, you know, um, you know, uh, 
movies like, you know, Sherlock Holmes, you know, mm. you see the tweed suits and stuff like that. And, um, you know, those sorts of things always add into it. But I've always absolutely loved the way a certain type of gentleman from Southern Italy have dressed. And I don't know where I get this from. Mm. I really don't know what it is. I really don't know what it is. But I've always liked the fact that when they wear suits, it just looks like they're living in them. It never looked like they were going to work. Although yeah. even if they were, it just didn't look like it was a work suit. It looked like it was a suit that they wore to look sexy. I love the fact that it was unabashedly masculine. And um, the fact that it just had this whole layer of, you know, you know, history and, and technique and tradition behind it as well. It just really ticked all the boxes. Mm. And when I went to Italy, mm. that's where you really live it. I mean, you go to Japan and you might never know that there is actually a tailoring you know, Service, yeah, or like tradition there. Tradition, yeah. I mean, everyone, you know, all the Saturday mang wear the, the suits, you know, and you see it. Mm. But, you know, you, I mean, you see that anywhere. So mm. oh, people wearing suits in the CBD, of course. You even go to England, and other than like Savile Row and some very specific streets, mm. you could be forgiven for even thinking that there is a tailoring industry. Yep. Um, I could be wrong, but that was that was my takeaway. That's the lesson. impression that That's you the impression had. I got um, yeah. when I went to London. However, when you go to Italy, it hits you in the face. Mm. It's everywhere, especially in certain towns that are. Um, certain cities that are more famous for it. It is everywhere, everywhere. And um, I think that was intoxicating. Mm. And the experience is very different as well. I mean, you go to like Hong Kong, you go to Malaysia, you know, they give you little swatches and you're like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll try this, whatever. You go to some of these Italian, you know, ateliers and, you know, they just have like a whole wall full of huge bolts of fabric. They open up a window, the sunshine's coming in, you can smell the coffee and the... In the air, you know, some, there's, there's some Italian woman singing. There's always a goddamn Italian woman <laughs> singing somewhere. And then, you know, in that full sunlight, you know, you can see that cloth and then they drape it on you. I mean, I'm sure mo uh, part of that is, you know, the art of sales. Yeah. But the experience itself was uh, utterly, utterly seductive and enchanting. Yeah. Well, it, and, it, yeah. it, paints, it paints imagery in your mind of, it's a very, like, a romantic ideal. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Um, I fell into it. And I fell into it. Um, I, I, a lot of people do fall in love with, um, you know, like Italian tailoring, particularly uh, Neapolitan tailoring, which is very much in vogue right now, um, you know, through other high end brands that had, you know, the, you know, the marketing and the reputation. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, high powered businessmen who would have loved, you know, brands from up north like Brioni and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, brands from the south like uh, Isaia or Keaton. Um I, I I knew about them because I read Star Forum mm. .net. I was I was crazy about it, but I, I I never. That was not my entry point. My entry point was 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 different. It was just hopping from tailor to tailor, trying to get to the what I understood to be the essence of you know masculine elegance. Yep. <laughs> and um, so I did you have to did you have to that. try suits from all yes. of these tailors? So yeah, you actually so it was went expensive. and purchased. Yeah. yeah, it was expensive. Yeah, it was an expensive process. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I used the tailor here in Leichhardt. You know, um, Adamo, amazing. Um, you know, uh, in Malaysia, I used Alok in, yeah, yeah, uh, just, just just so many. I used um, WW Chan in uh, Hong Kong. I used, uh, our, um, he, he's called Raffaello now, but um, he was called Sato Domenica. Uh, he was, uh, he's Japanese. I used B and Taylor in Korea. I used a couple of other tailors in Korea. And uh, when I was in Italy, I used maybe three or four tailors as well. Mm. But, um, Taylor for me now is the tailor for me. Yep. Yeah. And do you think um, is it is it, I guess because everybody's taste is different, right? So everybody would have a different take on who of course, their, of course, who their tailor should be. Of course. Of course. Um, but do you think that you know a trait of a good tailor is that they can tailor? Like, fuck, forget, excuse the pun. Tailor, yeah. tailor. You know their what their, their style to your vision. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's difficult, man. Um, I would. I would say that a good tailor should at the very least be able to cater to um, you know the vast majority of tastes mm. at least locally mm. if not like the international business standard yeah 
right? Having said that, because at the end of the day, a tailor should be able to make it. Any. Well, a tailor should be able to make any tailored garment, you know, yeah. provided that he has access to the patterns and he can, you know, you know, you know, cut it, cut a pattern for you, and then and then fit you. I mean, it should be there. Yeah. Having said that, it's not quite the case. Number one, all cutters and tailors have intensely personal ideas on how to get around certain technical problems. Yep. Like how to ease a certain type of type of sleeve into a certain type of shoulder. What type of collar looks good? What type of you know. Not even aesthetic. I'm not even talking about aesthetic considerations. Like mm. an aesthetic consideration is something that you could just be like, "Hey, man, uh, I want my lapel to be 12 centimeters wide, and that's it. Otherwise, I'm going somewhere else." Yeah, and you know that is something that any any it's basic appren- any apprentice could yep. kind of do. Yeah, I mean, I mean to yeah, I mean to do it with like an eye to detail, and you know, with an eye to the whole thing is obviously you know not that simple. But at the end of the day, it's just it's squiggles. It's mm. squiggles, but to overcome certain technical problems, like uh, what I call orthopedic tailoring. Like if someone's body was absolutely- f- Yeah, if you were absolutely fucked up and you needed yeah. to, you know- Try and get a bit more balance. Yeah, like that would be difficult. Yeah. If you uh, wanted lightness in a jacket and you know um, you chose a certain fabric, like how are you going to get the same amount of cleanliness through the chest and, you know, and-, and, and um, you know, play with that fine balance of the compromise between tidiness of the garment and lightness of the fit and the the garment itself. It, it, it's yeah, these things are very um, personal. Mm. And on top of that, you have like uh, you know local tastes. You have uh, you know yeah, which which more or less follow national boundaries, except in Italy where there's probably like three or four broad schools. Mm. And um, yeah, it's just not that easy. Everyone's got like their look. There are, there are fetishists like me who really love this stuff and mm. they will be able to say, look, if I had you know all the budget in the world, I'd get my double-breasted made by this guy, I'd get my single-breasted <laughs> by this guy. And look, and, and you can do that. Yeah. You, know, you can do that and it's not actually that ridiculous yeah. because certain people are actually really good at certain things. things yeah. However, I do think that a lot of people who say that are just saying that to just show off their sophistication. Yeah, that they know this person. I know this person, person, I know that person, I've been there, I've been yeah. there. And you know, I went through that phase too. But um, um, I think if you find someone who has a good sense of aesthetics that marries up with you and yep. they have the opportunity and, 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 and you have the pleasure of working with them, you know, m- maybe more than twice or three times, you're like 80, 90% there. Yeah. And you should be fine. You yep. should be fine. Um, other garments like shirts, you know, is, is a separate thing. You may have to find a shirt maker for that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and there are pants specialists, there are shoemakers, there are umbrella makers, there are, you know, tie makers. I mean, God, like it, it never ends. Yep. Um, and yeah, you may have to find certain craftsmen for that. Mm. But generally speaking, these craftsmen who have similar ideas of what looks good on people, um, they will know each other and they will refer you on. So it's, again, it's it's not that, it's not that hard, mm. I don't think. Yeah, it's a very, I think, I think you know, um, I think it, what I am, what I enjoy about that is that you know, you can pick a certain subject matter and there are so many different levels of how deep you can go. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, like hearing you, hearing you speak about that, there's, you, you've been through many different levels with that, you know. Oh, um, it's like Inception. Yeah, man, yeah. I'm in limbo right now. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in tailoring limbo. Four levels deep. <laughs> yeah, four levels deep and there's no kick that's getting me out, man. <laughs> um, I would, pr- uh, I mean... I mean, I love fashion too. Mm. Um, and I hate saying that out loud because I just realized how much like Brendan Schaub I just sounded like. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you watch but, Fighter and the Kid. Yeah. But, but yeah. But you've, you've always had this passion. I love my fashion B. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've, I've always been interested in what I, you know, what to wear. I mean, yeah. you wouldn't really know it from what I'm wearing now, but I'm, I'm, I've always been interested in, you know, in, in, in clothing on some level. Yep. Uh, I would say problem with fashion is that the big part of fashion is chasing Mm. you're chasing a trend you're chasing a look you're chasing a an in color you're chasing the it brand designer and don't get me wrong some of the most revolutionary ideas and things that we take for granted have been at one point the whimsy of a of a of a of a fashion designer Mm. right like a-line dresses with uh with christian dior or Mm. like uh the fact that when we wear business shirts the collar is actually attached to the shirt. I mean, that was an innovation from Chave in Paris. Yeah. Um, yeah. These are things that we could not live without anymore. Yeah, right? That's right. It's a staple. It's a staple. Yeah. Absolutely. 
But at one point, it was a novelty. Yeah, to have a collar. <laughs> a collar that was attached. Attached, yeah. It was a floating collar, right? Before it was floating because it was just easier to just change your collar and wash the collars. Whereas yeah, the yeah, shirt you would wash maybe once a week. Yep. It sounds so distastefully unhygienic now, but that really was the consideration back the then. The world was a much more unhygienic place back then. Yeah, it was. Absolutely. Right? Um, you know, and obviously there are certain things like in fashion now that, you know, we think, I mean, when you see like a rich, like Chinese guy on the street, that's wearing like chunky sneakers, you know, high end drop crotch, you know, atrociously expensive, you know, track pants and like a sweater that's got holes in it. And like, a, you know, like, you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Like, there are certain looks out there. It's so easy to, you know, ridicule that mm. and call them, Oh, it's a fashion victim and stuff like that. Um, however, having said that, we have to remember even the fact that we're wearing athleisure right now mm. is interesting. Athleisure is mainstream now. Mm. And if you look at athleisure, we're talking about cuffed pants, you know, usually drop crotch somewhat, or um, you know, carrot tops or slim. We have scalloped tees, mm. like t shirts that are a little longer than they would normally be. Yep. Even the jacket that I'm wearing right now from Nike, like the back is a little, like a, a, a good five centimeters longer than the front. Yeah. Um, certain silhouettes come to prominence. Mm. And these silhouettes probably came to prominence because of Rick Owen and maybe like Jill Sanders, you know, before that and stuff like that. I think there's um, also... About 10, 15 years ago. I think there's also elements of, um, you know, when we think about, you know, the uh, the current conditions that the world is in, you know, with this whole COVID thing, right? Mm. Um, you know, one of my one of my uh, good client and uh, I would say a good friend of mine, um, Peter was he 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 has some retailing businesses and he was saying how you know the new uh, I guess Australian uniform mm. is you know sweat sweat pants and 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 uh, pajama shirts like like all sweatshirts and jumpers and and those sorts of things because yeah. when everybody's been in lockdown through yeah. this whole period, everybody wants to be comfortable, yeah, right. And so th- you know his business experienced a boom in sales on on that front. Sure. Um, and I think because of that, it's it's sort of normalised it, right? Mm. Because everybody owns it, um, and it's just become just that that little bit more socially acceptable. It's that true. You can it's wear true. it out. It's true. However, I would counter that by saying Gymshark is now a billion dollar company, mm. and that was before coronavirus. Yep. Lululemon again. Yeah. Huge, so that's active wear, right? Huge. Yeah. So even look at Nike. You know, back yeah. in the day, it was like, who wears Nike? It yep. was like you're either training or that was the only thing you could afford to wear and you wanted to sort of show people I'm wearing a brand. Yeah. The brand is Nike. Well, or there's, that, there's that whole parody of the girls singing that active wear, active yeah, wear, active wear active doing wear. everything in my active exactly, wear. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that is all pre-COVID. Yeah. And I would say that high-end active wear, the, the idea that, you know, something can be comfortable and luxurious you know, I mean, that that was even around with Paris Hilton and um and Juicy Couture, you know, mm. as ugly as I think that is, like, this is still something that, you know, is at the end of the day, an idea somewhere that mm. becomes, you know, becomes a reality. Mm. Sometimes it becomes commercialized and sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it's adopted, you know, in a widespread sort of fashion. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think there are multiple factors around it. Like, I, I think some things will just never be adopted or yep. just it will be so difficult to adopt. Yep. Like, for example, dresses for men is something yep. that, um, you know, a couple of designers have pushed in the past, you know, like 10, yep. 15 years. And don't get me wrong. Like, I actually think that it could look good, right? Mm. And look, kilts on men, like in, in Scotland. Scotland is fine. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the cheap power for, like, Chinese people, like, again, it looks like a dress, right? Yep. Um I don't see a man wearing cheap out there. <laughs> no, no, no. Of course not. Right? Of course not. <laughs> however, however, I think there are just certain cultural norms that just take so much time. Time, yeah. And I think there are broad uh, fashion trends which roughly last around eight to twelve years. Let's just say a decade. Yep. And I think those sort of like come and go. And people always say it's cyclical, but it's not truly cyclical. Well, yeah. If you were, if if it was cyclical, then you'd say, okay, we let's go be, back a hundred years. Yeah, let's. And we wear, s- we let's, should be able to see the same kind of fashion. Yeah, and, it's, you don't. and it's not true. No, yeah. it's not true. And and, and like it's, and like, it's all yeah. evolving. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. always evolving. It's always, you know, coming back with, with, with little with tweaks t- and stuff like t- that. Yeah, with a twist. And the tweaks and the twists sort of come uh, from the realm of t- technology, I would say. So mm. like fabrics get better. Um, yeah, potentially you could say marketing, but not so much. I would production say methods change. Production methods change, logistical challenge, uh, you know, channels change, you know. Mm. Certain things are c- considered extremely expensive at mm. one point. So, for example, buttons were considered very expensive. Yep. Like two, three hundred years ago. So if you look at like... Um, 
you know, you look at like oil paintings of like, you know, composers and, uh, you know, kings and queens and monarchs, you know, they always have like just tons of buttons on their cuffs and stuff yep. like that. And, and that was a sign of wealth. Yep. It was a sign of wealth. Whereas now, that's not the case at all. Yeah. And even in high-end tailoring, the closest thing to it is maybe like handmade buttonholes. Mm. Like that's a sign of like... Um, yeah, and buttonholes you know, at work. And buttonholes at work. On, on especially And double points if it works and triple points if they're handmade, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, mm. these are things that like, you know, sort of you know, yep. come. But I, I think that, um, yeah, technology is, is, is the main thing um, because it just... It just means that different things are possible. Mm. And at the end of the day, I think men, male fashion, is a, is a little less whimsical than women's fashion mm. because I just think at the end of the day, I know that this is a very sexist comment, it's uber traditional, but at the end of the day, there are enough men who just don't give a fuck and they yeah. just want to look. It's never going to be able to push the needle. Yeah, yeah, like I just, like as 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 much as there are like crazy fashionista men and, mm. and the majority of like, you know, really extreme um, designers are men. Mm. The number of men who are walking the streets wearing kilts and like bright pink, like, yeah. you know, denim suits, very low. Yeah. Whereas there are far more women who are willing to try, yeah. you know, runway looks, you know. Yeah, and uh, have and have the idol. confidence to try and pull it off, right? Have I the think confidence. It's, it's just far more socially acceptable. Yeah. And you know what? Like men are going to be like, wow, like that looks kind of good. Yeah. Right? Whereas I think women might look at a man and be like, I don't know if this guy knows the rules of society. Why is he dressed like this? <laughs> yeah. Is he homeless? Yeah. You know, you might get fashionista women who are like, oh, I get exactly what he's doing. He's trying to do yeah, 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 yeah. the majority, right? And if no. the whole point of it is, it's almost like peacocking, right? You, you're doing it. Yeah, yeah, I see that you are well-versed in the mystery method. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah Peacocking, yeah, exactly. <laughs> look, you can do that. And look, there are elements of doing that. Yeah. Um, and there's always going to be elements of that. Yeah. Um, but I think well, at the end of the day large, you're doing yeah. it because it, you, the reason why people get into these things is because it's going to create a feeling right yeah so whether that, that feeling, feeling. Is, you're chasing a feeling whether it's feeling. how that makes you feel or how other people's reactions make you feel yeah that's the reason and, and I guess that's the reason why there are these bespoke industries yeah, you know yeah, absolutely um, so, so likewise you know like uh, you know I'm in a business where we retail BMW cars mm. you know why a BMW and, and not a a Toyota or a Kia or, or whatever other of these other brands is because, you know, um, there is a premise um, that BMW builds its reputation around and that's, you know, um, good, great driving cars, you know, the ultimate driving machines. Yeah. Right. Yeah, sure. And and so, when, when, you know, we'd love to sell to everybody, but that's not what we're, mm. what we're, what we're focusing on. You know, I think you need to stand for something. Mm. So then um, you have always have loyal advocates that will want to, you know, um, follow you for that reason. Mm. And then, through, I guess, that um, contagious kind of uh, passion. You know, when, mm. when people hear somebody else is very passionate about something, you know, sometimes that brings people along the journey too. Mm. Uh, and so I think, you know, just like, you know, when, we, when people talk about early adopters, it's almost like that. You know, if you have a brand that stands for something, um, you're going to always create loyal advocates yes. that believe in it. And then you're going to have, you know, when those people talk about it, that, that passion comes through to the surface and brings other people along the journey. And then those people will then, you know, try and experience it. Yeah, you know, to see how it makes them feel, and yeah, sometimes absolutely. the shoe fits, sometimes the shoe doesn't fit. Sure, um, sure. Some people I, don't want to be in a real world drive car. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, everybody, everybody's got their different tastes, but you got to stand for something. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just going back to you know you working at Hugo Boss, mm. um, was there any sale that really stood out for you? Um, yeah, there were a couple um, for different reasons. Uh, You know, there was one where um, I sold like four suits, like eight shirts and like three shoes to like one person. Mm. That was the first time I was like, wow, I just got someone to spend like $50,000. I was yeah. like, wow, that's pretty cool. You know, as a student, you know, that was um, amazing. And were you guys commissions based as well? Um, well? Okay. So Hugo Boss Now is owned by a different group. Hugo okay. Boss Now is called HBA Australia. You know, Hugo Boss Australia. Before yep. that, it was privately owned. It was licensed. So I believe I'm allowed to say this. And the answer is yes. We okay. were on commission. Yeah. We weren't normally, but when we were allowed to, when we sold certain items, mm. we were given commission. Yes. Uh, look, I think it's natural for most sales industries to, to have a basis of commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the thing um, was that most of these items were actually old. Okay. Yeah. But, you know, still good stock. Yep. 
So, yeah, I mean, okay. there was nothing unethical about it. Yep. Some salesmen were unethical about it. They yep. said, this is the latest fashion. Yeah, they <laughs> pushed know. it, yeah. But, um, you know, I never did that. I just said, look, this is something that, this is exactly what you're looking for. Yep. And if they took it, they took it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then, so then what was the transition out of, out of, out of Hugo Boss and into the next venture? So well, I graduated university and, um, you know, I had to work Monday to Friday and uh, so I was as a physio, as a physio, yes, yep. and I maintained my Sunday shifts um, at Hugo Boss. And after a while, uh, it just became um, unsustainable. Mm. And I also felt bad that um, I mean, the Sunday shift is awesome, man. It's yep. awesome. I mean, you get paid a time and a time half. And, a half. Yep. and um, you know, it was like I think it was like ten o'clock to like four. You know, yep. it was chill. It was quiet. I really didn't care. I could wake up late, rock up to work, and then just you know leave early and just kick it back, right? Yeah. But um, you know, I wanted other people to have that, and uh, I mean, I'm not to sound selfless. I, I just started burning out, to be honest. Yep. And I started to really dislike the brand and um, the sort of clothes that they were pushing. And then the, the change in management happened, and uh, all the people that I enjoyed working with, they either were at different branches or. Um, they quit or they were yep, fired. Moved on. Yep. Yeah, and I just was like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Mm. I don't want to do this anymore. And um, I started um, a small business where I would see young people with disabilities in aged care centers. Mm -hmm. So that was the beginning of the company that I, my main company, Virtus Rehab. That's where we started. And then after a while, uh, something traumatic happened and um, I realized that I had my priorities wrong. And I just transitioned that into a full-blown company straight away. So when you say something traumatic, yes, um, do you, can you elaborate of on course, that? Of yep. course, of uh, course. Monday to Fridays from the ages of 21 to 25, I think, I worked my butt off. Yep. Uh, I probably wasn't a very good partner, to be honest. Mm. I worked my butt off. So I was a very good employee. And um, I had a friend who you know one of my closest friends and he would always ask me hey let's have dinner let's have dinner and towards the end of it i was just like hey man i, I gotta work i gotta make my money you know i was making the the big bucks mm. you know quote unquote you know like yeah. i don't know whatever yeah you were chasing you were chasing <laughs> whatever it was feeding the ego yeah whatever it was like 90 yeah. 90k a year or something I, I honestly i don't even remember anymore it was just so in, 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 in it was hindsight. a blur because you were just working in hindsight it was so inconsequential yeah and, um, uh, you know, he was a doctor mm -hmm. and he, I was already three years out. He was then, f you know, first year out. And I remember this was back when I used to use Facebook. There was a um, post that said, hey, uh, I need my queen's birthday shift off. I'm willing to swap two, three or even four shifts to get that day off. And I remember thinking, wow, my friend really wants that day off. Yep. And he called me. He had called me that week saying, hey, do you want to go for dinner? And I was like, nah, 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 I'm working hard, I'm working hard. And the whole reason why I was working hard was because A, I wanted to be a good employee and feed my ego. Two, I wanted to make money and feed my ego. And three, I wanted to make money and save up so that I could expand on my personal business, which I would open when I was 30. Mm. I was kind of putting it off. And then I'll never forget it, man. Uh, it was Queen's birthday. And then on the Tuesday, I had a lot of work to catch up on. I was at the office and the light was kind of like what it is now. You know, the sun's kind of setting. It's mm. around, you know, it was around six o'clock or so. No, no, it was earlier than that. It was maybe 5.30 or so. It was, it was quite dark. And I got a text message saying, hey, you know, um, you know our friend, he's, uh, he's in hospital. And I remember thinking, of course he's in hospital. He's a doctor. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? Then I got another message saying he's in hospital for something that happened to him. And I remember thinking, oh, well, the last time he was hospitalized was when he did well in the exams. And then I forced him to drink 15 shots of vodka in like 10 minutes and he passed out. Mm. And he had to pump his stomach. Okay. Mm. Then I got another message saying, uh, Edward, you should probably, we should probably go visit him. He's in Newcastle. And I went, why the hell's in Newcastle? At the time he was working at um, St. George. Yeah. Why the hell is he in Newcastle? I went, okay. And then I got a phone call from a close friend who was close to both of us. And he said, Edward, the family is requesting you to come up because they're turning life support off at midnight. And I went, oh, oh. And I remember I just looked at my work that I was doing, trying to meet all my KPIs and stuff like that. And I just like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. I dropped everything that moment. 
and uh, I drove to Newcastle, saw him, bid goodbye. He was already brain dead. And I met the girl that he was up there with. He was going to propose to her. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was when the uh, accident happened. He was, uh, they were both on push bikes and um, he was hit by a car. He was wearing a helmet and he landed incorrectly and uh, a rock, a stone hit his brainstem, like just under the, just under the, just under the helmet. Yeah. yeah. The U driver was drunk and um, you know, that's kind of what happened. And uh, yeah, I remember in that moment just thinking, wait, why did I say no to this guy? Yeah. He just wanted to have dinner with me. Yeah. He probably well, wanted to tell, he wanted to introduce he me to her. And well. to probably tell you what he was going to do, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're best friends. And um, I remember just going, oh my fucking God. I'm like, what have I done? Yeah. And I called my boss that night. So I texted him saying, I can't come into work tomorrow. I called him the next day and I said, look, I'm quitting. I can't yep. do this. Yeah. But I'm giving you six months notice. <laughs> I gave him six months notice and he's like, uh, can we renegotiate? Blah, blah, blah. I said, no, I'm quitting. I, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And I told him, you know, my friend what happened? died. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, um, that was when I just started ramping up preparations for my business. And I said, look, I could do it when I'm 30, but I looked at myself and I'm like, man, I'm 25. My I friend just died at 25, 26. Yep. Uh, it was 2012 actually. 2000, 2000, 12 so he was 25 yeah because i remember we used to joke you know oh, 2012 is when the world's meant to end right yeah and he actually died which you know was just just nuts and um yeah so he was 25 i was 24 i made preparations and then yeah that was, that was it. it started my business yeah like that straight away and um i took multiple calculated risks i started hiring people my neck saw. Uh -huh. and Some good cracks yeah, there. yeah man and you didn't even need somebody to adjust you no nope. perks of being a physio <laughs> and uh yeah i started it and i just i just did it myself and i uh i never looked back yeah i never looked back there were ups and downs definitely mm. always ups and downs but um yeah i wouldn't have it any other way let's okay well let's let's unpack unpack that there's a few things that i want to go through there it's pretty crazy we've been talking for about like two hours and we're you know we're only we're only getting into the, the meat of things. Yeah, that's right. We're definitely going to have to do more than one of these <laughs> for sure. That's all right. But anyway, well, please continue. So, okay. Um, so the reason why I want to unpack this is because I think it's, it's, it's relevant to talk about grief. Because mm -hmm. um, as you, I think, um, um, did I tell you the reason why I started yes. this project? Yes, yes so I told you. That, yeah. yeah. And so um, it was actually just um, Ada's birthday um, last week. Wow. Where, where are we? Well, August 26th anyway. Wow, last week. Yeah. Um, and um, so, you know, uh, me and a couple of the guys, and I think all, most of the high school guys you know, in our immediate group um, went to go visit his memorial. Mm. And, um, you know, so I guess it, it's, it's been over a year. Like he, 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 he left us last year. Mm. Um, and I was thinking back, you know, just when I'm hearing your story there, that, you know, um, so on that Easter Monday, you know, Ivan and I, uh, we had our families together at Ivan's place, you know, having having a barbecue and age uh, out of the blue, you know, um, came came out, you know, and he, and I guess typically he wouldn't normally come out because he's always, you know, been busy or something and we were sort of used to it. Like we didn't sure. really think anything of it because normally, you know, if he can't, like we always invite him to things and then, you know, if he could make it, he goes, I'll, I'll come if I can. If not, you know, you guys go on ahead, sure. blah, blah, blah. Sure. And, you know, I guess, you know, um, we didn't really think anything of it because sometimes he's there, sometimes he's not. Sure. And, um, and, he, and, he, and he was there that night. And, um, you know, I guess when, when, when I sort of think back on it, I, th I view that as, you know, that was him almost maybe saying goodbye. You know, that was yeah. his goodbye, you know, giving us one last chance to, to see him. And, yeah. and um, yeah. that's the way that I would view it as opposed to, you know, well, maybe, you know, I don't know what happened post that, you know, to, to them – have him want to commit suicide. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just remember, you know, a thing that st stood out for me was, you know, um, I, I threw my son, who was just a baby at the time, Harley, and I threw him at age and I said, oh, yeah, you want to have a hold? And he's like, yeah, and he's having a hold. Mm. And he's and he's looking at him and and I took I took some photos of, of them together and, and I didn't take any photos Man, of I us. I can only imagine what was running through his head in that moment to be, I mean, contemplating suicide is something that takes a long time. Yeah. I mean, 
again, like the evidence suggests that when men go through with it, they do it mm. and they plan it ahead. Mm. So for him to be on the precipice of planning his own extinction mm. and to be holding something which is symbolic, the very symbol of life itself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, yeah, it's nuts, man. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I, 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 I think back on that and then, you know, when, when, when I got told the news, you know, um, it was a shock, right? Just yeah. like, you know, you, you were probably at your, de- your, your work desk. Like I was at, uh, I think I was at work myself. Um, it just feels like another day. Yeah. Just another day. And, you know. And then um, it's not. Yeah. And, and, and I guess, you know, there's a, good, there's a good saying that I heard the other day that, I, that I've, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing, mm-hmm. uh, which was that in the seed of suffering, there is a catalyst for change. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we, we all get very caught up in our, in our lives and our ego, you know, trying to chase these magical pipe dreams sure. that we're going to achieve this or we're going to achieve that. Sure. Um, and then at this point, you know, perhaps this one thing is going to make me happy or that one thing is going to make, make you happy, but none of it actually no. really truly gives you happiness, no. sustainable happiness. No. You no. know, you might have that, that fleeting moment where you go, yes, I achieved a goal. Yes. And then you go, and then what? And yeah, and, and you know, don't get me wrong, like those things are worthwhile, yeah. right? But, but it's not happiness. Yeah. And, uh, you know, what is happiness? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's something that uh, I think that's a question that everyone asks themselves at one point or another. Some people think about it more deeply than others. Yeah. Um, I think at the end of the day, it is a fundamental human concern. Yeah. And... Yeah, I I am of the opinion that um, it is a question that uh, it, it's kind of like what is the meaning of life. Mm. You know? uh, I know this sounds a, li- a little bit like a cop out, but I do think that it might be true. Just because a question is grammatically correct doesn't mean that it's a genuine question. Mm. Well, I mean, I could say, "What is the feeling of yellow?" And you'd be like, "Uh, okay, you know, mm. right? You know, or what is the, you know, what is the orange of jujitsu?" Uh, okay you know like the sentence kind of yeah you know, grammatically makes sense but, but it doesn't actually yeah. mean yeah I, I think it's a cop-out i think you know what is the purpose of life is a little bit like that mm. you know i don't know if it's actually a um genuine question it sounds very nihilistic i i don't think that is the case i think there is you know incredible meaning in life you know that we uh that we that we imbue it ourselves, mm. you know, like that is kind of yeah. the takeaway. It's from What like, does it mean to you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, like for me, one of my favorite authors is Albert Camus and, you know, and, uh, you know, he, you know, ex- you know, he expands on that extensively, you know, in his writings and um, yeah, just, uh, just dealing with the absurdity of life is what gives it the meaning. Mm. Right. And I think happiness is just one of those things. It's just one of those bonuses that we pick up. Mm. Uh, along the way and um, ultimately maybe it's not happiness but rather it's potentially meaning um, that is the purpose of life mm. meaning you know what is the significance of this why did I do this you know am I doing this voluntarily you know uh, you know it's all, I, but it's yeah. all it's all I think it's all relative as well yes it is that because if you don't have a benchmark whether you call it happiness or joy or sadness of course, yeah. Then, then right. you don't have any sort of objective measure. That's right. So there is a C. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that yeah. that is that becomes your your yardstick to then yeah. gauge that yeah. that sort of emotion. Um, but I guess you know, speaking to 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 that tra- trauma that you experienced, mm-hmm. um, I guess you know, what was, what did you find helped you process those emotions? Uh, I wrote a letter to him at the back of a journal that I kept when we traveled together. So yep. he was one of uh, four. We went to South America together when we were 18. And it was just a journal of our travels and, you know, how we thought we were going to get laid and we didn't. <laughs> but at the <laughs> end... South America. Yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the, you know, of the, of the, of the journal, like uh, there were a couple of pages blank and I just wrote a letter to him, you know. I wrote it as though he was still alive, of yep. course. Um, apologizing that I never made it to dinner with him. Um, you know, just to let him know that I felt guilty and ashamed. Um, I had a lot of feelings there, you know, and um, I said something along the lines of, um, 
I think I was, I think I said something like, look, I was chasing, you know, like $10,000, $20,000 here and there. But like, even if I had like, you know, all the money in the entire universe, like it's never going to bring you back. Yeah. Um, so I wrote that. There were a couple of things like that. I think throwing myself into like preparing like for work, because that, that was something that he was kind of like, Edward, you should do that earlier. That kind of helped me deal with it. Mm. I never cried over him. Mm. Uh, probably because as men, you know, um, we're taught not to cry. Mm. Um, I think I cried once in a dream and I woke up going, oh my God, I've cried finally. And I touched my face and I was like, no, I wasn't crying. I was yeah. crying in my in sleep. Dream. Yeah, crying in my dream yeah. rather. And um, no, I never really got to, I mean, I talked to my friends about it a lot. You know, obviously we all, it was like a school reunion. Mm. We got to the funeral and stuff like that. But, you know, like even then I just, nah, it, it, I'm well aware I sound like an emotionally unhealthy person right now. But no, I never really processed it like that. I think I just grieved it by just by throwing myself and starting that work mm. and kind of upholding myself to some promises that I made him and myself and writing that letter, perhaps crying about it in my sleep. And later, maybe like two years later when my dog died, cried mm. and i f and i cried like a baby then mm. you know i was just driving and I'm like, you know and <laughs> i suspect that the wires got crossed yeah and because i feel like i'm allowed to cry over a dog yeah i think that was when everything came out yeah don't get me wrong i love my dog and i, yeah. I, I would cry like that over any dog that i have known for yeah. like 10 15 years yeah i knew her for 15 years right yeah so i would cry like that again However, I do think there was something there because after that, I no longer had the dreams. Yeah. Like, it's not like the dreams like haunted me. It's not like I was dreaming about him like every week or every night. But, it, you know, I would have it maybe like once every few months. Yeah. You know? But the Did dreams you, stopped after that. So in, in those dreams, what what would happen? Was it just reliving that? that, that, that no, or? no, it was just super generic. It would just be like, hey, let's have dinner. Mm-hmm. You know, or just really mundane things. Yeah. Just say, hey, let's go play football, soccer, you know. Yeah. And then, yeah, that was it. And then there was like once the time, you know, in my in, in the dream when I was crying was when I was kind of reliving that... Uh, moment. Yep. Yeah, that moment. But no, nah, everything else was really mundane. So, yeah, um, a funny, well, not, it's, I think not funny, but uncanny thing that, um, that happened earlier this year, you know, that Ivan and I talking about was that you know we, we both had a, a dream about our, our mate mm-hmm. and um and he just said to us you know we said to me in, in my dream you know i'm all right you know everything's all right and um yeah and um and i haven't had a similar dream too and then even one of our other mates eddie had had a similar dream as well mm. um and i i don't know whether that you know i guess to me it means something mm. you know like i i think you know um for all the sort of um, all the things that he was going through, then, mm. you know, if I don't know if it's just to make myself feel better, but I just felt, felt it was very odd that, you know, the three of us could have such a, a similar dream, mm. Mm. you know, and I could only sort of take it as a, as a sign that, you know, he's, he's okay. You know, he's, yeah. he's in a better place, Sure, sure. you know. Um, did you ever have anything like that happen? I remember making a comment to uh, another close friend saying, you know, it sucks that he died, that he passed away. But at the same time, there's something also to be said about passing away at the peak of happiness. Mm. You know, he just finished uni. Yeah. He was just beginning to work. Yeah. He was, you know. Wanting to get engaged. Yeah, he was wanting to get engaged. He was in love. Yeah. You know, he was 25 years old. Yeah. You know old enough to know better, young enough to do it anyway. Yeah. He's in the Hunter Valley riding a bike. Yeah. He had just come back from exchange the year before, you know, um, uh, I believe he was in Norway and he met the girl there, you know, yeah. she was German and he was always talking about like German girls in Germany. Yeah. He was a Bundesliga fan. You yeah. Know? And, um, you know, his parents were healthy. I mean, it, it, I, I get not to get down, but you know the funny thing is, is that it's almost like the best case scenario for us. Yeah, is that we get old, we see our faculties diminish. Yeah, 
we say goodbye to our friends one <laughs> by one. Yeah. <laughs> Even the person that we love, we yeah. have to say goodbye to, right? I mean, and when you say it like that, it's like, shit, the, the, the best case scenario, it doesn't sound that great. Yeah. Maybe I want what he had. Yeah, that's you know? right. He, he, he exited on a high. Yeah. yeah. So we, we kind of joked about that. Um, we kind of joked about that and, you know, we just kind of sat quietly and just, you know, sipped our beers and sort of like, you know, uh, that South America trip was good, wasn't it? Um, he was Iranian and he, uh, I believe they have a tradition where they burn personal belongings mm. as like a... Yeah, offering or effigy or something. What would be the word in English? Maybe, I, I guess catharsis. Yeah, yeah. Like, a, like a cathartic sort of like, let's... Yeah. let's let's Let it out. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'll never forget that. It was in winter. We were at his house and we were just burning like certain things of his. And um, yeah, I think that was kind of like the, like the moment. Yeah, that was kind of the moment. Mm. Um, it, it is something that I've thought about and tried to unpack in my mind backwards and forwards. But un- unfortunately, it's a little bit like the latest Christopher Nolan film, Tenet. Um, there Have is, you seen it? I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen it. And, uh, <laughs> no spoilers, no spoilers. But um, yeah, it is, it is highly confusing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it is highly confusing and um, you know, enjoyable, but also um, confusing nonetheless. Highly confusing. Yeah. I, 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 will, I will refrain from talking about my, uh, my judgment. I'm a huge fan of his... Um, and I will rewatch it. Yeah, that's all I'll say. I will yep. rewatch it out of respect to him, but I'm not entirely convinced that it is his. <laughs> you know that it's his best work. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. All right. Well, rather than try and butcher the the remaining stories and try and squeeze them in mm-hmm. a short time frame, I reckon we pull up stumps here. Sure. And we'll come back another day. And sure. We'll do we'll do a part two on this because there's still so much that we yeah, haven't really yeah, gotten to. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, but Absolutely. I'm also conscious of time and, you know, for anyone that's still listening, it's been two hours and 15 odd minutes. So, oh boy, um, oh boy. We'll have, to re- do, we'll have to do a part two and potentially a part three, depending yeah, on how much we yeah, get through in the next yeah, one. Yeah, definitely. Um, there are so many things that I would love to talk about and, um, you know. We didn't even get to talk about, you know, rehabbing injuries and that sort of no, stuff. No, no, of course. And, you know, my thoughts on, you know, fad diets, you know, certain <laughs> types of training. We didn't talk about BJJ. Yep. Uh, you know, we... You know, we, we didn't talk about, um, you know, relationships other than, you know, like the mystery method in Tinder. <laughs> you know, we didn't talk about cars. You know, yep. there's just so many things that we could have talked about as well as our, you know, sort of personal friendship and getting to know one another more uh, personably. You know, last year, Melbourne, that yep. would have been, you know, like the like the real sort of starting point for it. Yep. And um, yeah, I, I would. I would. Thanks so much for having me on. Uh, right. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, uh, I, I appreciate do, you coming on. No worries. I, I do have the, uh, the 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 habit of dragging things on and sounding like a wanker. So to you know your uh, listeners out there, <laughs> thank you so much for um, you know uh, listening. I'm sure I've butchered some of the uh, the intellectual pseudo intellectual bits there as well. No, that's okay. Uh, hopefully, people walk away with something that they can use with this uh, conversation. Yep. And um, I can't wait to do it again. Yep. There's so many 100%. more things to talk about. Yep. So we've just we've only just we've just given the tip. Just, just the tip. You've <laughs> just had the tip of Edward. It's time to give you the full shaft, okay? <laughs> All right. On that note, we'll go balls deep. Goodbye, deep everyone. Soon. Bye. Cheers. <laughs>